nice tuning issues there as well. And we're, we're going, it's all go. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to That Pedal Show viewers, comments and questions live. Dan here. Mick here, hello. Uh, we are recording and I do believe we are sans click track this week. Have which, a click track? Yeah, I listened to it today and I thought, that's a good sounding click track. It was nice and strong and really loud. <laughs> for, the, for those of you interested, it's the click track in uh, Universal Audio Luna, which is what we use to process the audio for this. Could have had a shaker or, you know, some sort of hi-hat, but no, we went for traditional bink, bonk, bonk. It was great. Yeah, yeah so if, welcome everyone. I hope you're all doing awesome. I'm back on coffee at the moment, so I'm feeling awesome. We'll see how this goes, yeah. Uh, we've got the usual thing with the audio where it's really loud and then not very loud again. Okay. It's so annoying. Yeah. Apparently, it's to do with... Um, Apparently... It's to do with buffering. It gets oh. compressed in the buffering, apparently. Oh, interesting. Anyway, okay. Greetings, everyone. Yes, greetings. Welcome to uh, viewers' comments and questions. If you're new, uh, an extra special welcome. If you're not new, an extra special welcome. Indeed. We do this every week. Uh, we talk about stuff. We take comments. We prioritise the super chats. It usually goes on for about two hours because lots of rambling occurs. Um... <laughs> So yeah, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who have we got on tonight? We have, let's see. Uh, uh, come on, press the button. Um, do, 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 do. That's not what we need. Daniel and I have been learning songs for our upcoming gigs with um, Andy Simmons. And as uh, I sometimes do, I've left everything till the last minute. Well... Yeah. Which is pretty scary, but also it does rather concentrate the mind. At least the songs are really tricky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> At least the songs are hard. Yeah. Um, um, I've, I had a FaceTime with Andy last night going right. over some of the some of the stuff. And um, yeah, that he wants us to do a song with him at the end. Right. Um, one of his songs. One of his songs. It's, it's, it's just a no from me. It's... <laughs> Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine. It'll, uh, be all, it'll be all good. Depends how many chords there are. There's four chords. That's all you got to play. Oh, uh, right. I promise. Oh, I can do That's that. It. There you go. Well, you didn't say I'll which chords. I'll write them down. <laughs> I'll write them down. Are they sad chords or happy chords? <laughs> There's a mixture of sad chords and happy chords. You start off sad, but you're happy by the end. Okay. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, right, on tonight we have, uh, first of all, BV Ninja, thank you as always for moderating and doing a fantastic job in there. Absolute superstar. Generally having our backs and the backs of the nice people who frequent this place. Thank you, BV. We greatly appreciate it. Yes, mate. Um, let's see. Daniel Herbert, who is also saying thank you to BV. Hello, Daniel. Nick Tilleros, greetings from Germany. Ah, hello to Germany. Uh, Cola Boyoti. Is on. George Radcliffe is on. Oliver Boysen is on. Buzz Wilson. Chris Warburton. Chris. Uh, hello, Chris. Uh, Tom. E Eagle Ray Rob is on. Someone from Sweden called Old Wood Smells Good. Mm. I couldn't agree more. Mm, it does. I've, I've become slightly fascinated by trees just recently. Ah, <sighs> oh, yeah. That's the smell of sweat. <laughs> or indeed, sweat. sweat. If you've been hanging around with Neil Finn for too long. He has sweat in his piddles. Yes, it's got, it's got a bit of sweat in that one. <laughs> a bit of sweat in my piddles. <laughs> Sorry, that was more South African. I better stay away from the Antipodean accents. Not my thing. Yeah. Um, Subro Pontes, hello. David Rustad, hey David. Dave Johnson, Tim Chalmers, Zutalurs. Oh, Zutalurs. Hello, buddy. John Channing, Chris Effort, greetings from Denmark. I need to get back there. It was well fun. Christopher Miles. He's on. Hello, Christopher. Albus Aaron is on. Gordon Rankin. G'day, buddy. Yeah. Lots of lovely humans on tonight. Thank yeah. you for being with us. Yes. So, um, yeah, just a quick news. Thanks for all the love for the uh, Neil Finn, uh, Liam Finn video. That was a real highlight for me, a day that we'll never forget. And yes, it's it, so that literally did happen. We made a, a spinal tap gag on the way there and then... We run into Davidson Hubbins. We were sat 
in a restaurant having some food between so we did the interview with Neil and Liam and Marcus in the afternoon sound check kind of time then there was a bit of time to kill before the show so we went off and had some food and we were sat with Dan's wife and his daughter and Martine said that guy's in Spinal Tap and he was sat in the restaurant and it was Michael McKean and he turned up and he you know for better or worse, Dan and I have met a lot of famous people and a lot of crazy famous people too. And you sort of, after a while, you know, you, you, you keep your composure because it's just not cool to be all fanboy around, even though we well, do you it on do. the show. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. We do it on the show, obviously. We're a bit fanboy sometimes. But, you know, generally you try and be a little bit cool if you're, if you're working with famous people. Anyway, no cool whatsoever for Michael McKean. We jump up from our table and we sprint outside and everyone's going what's going on and we run down and um mike was stood at the traffic lights with his wife yeah and we're like we you know just we're not the whole we're not worthy moment. i couldn't get my words out yeah i yeah, even yeah. called him mr mckean i think yeah. mr mckean mr mckean please, please, oh, big, please mr mckean we're big fans of your show we, we quote you all the time and he said you don't pay me for that do you and i'm like oh. <laughs> he was joking of course he was he was so nice yeah, yeah and uh yeah so that was that was a moment that we'll never forget yeah so really wonderful anyway neil finn whatever <laughs> just i don't mean that by the way it was a life-changing day so i've been lucky enough to see neil um and meet him a few times when he's been out here doing his thing and one of my favorite things that we got to experience is being there at soundcheck mm. And it's just us and the band. It was, uh, you know, hairs on your arms standing up. And yeah, yeah. It was pretty special. Uh, you know, as big crowded house fans. Yeah. I was talking to Paul Stacey today, and Paul Stacey toured as Neil's guitar player, actually. Oh, no way. For the um, the Finn Brothers album. Wow. And when I first met Paul, and that was nearly 20 years ago. Oh, no way. So Paul and Jeremy were playing in the band. Yeah. And I did his rig for that. That's the first time I ever saw one of my rigs on stage at Albert Hall. <laughs> right? So um, I was talking to Paul about that, and he toured with him sort of on and off for like two years. And he said every single night it was an album-worthy vocal performance. Yeah, you could yeah. take it any night and record it, yeah. and stick it on an album. I was amazed because he's uh, – we, we had to Google it. He's 64 years old now or thereabouts. And uh, – you know, there, there is a thing that happens with age and voices, but man, he was absolutely 100% on it. Uh, unbelievable. It was spectacularly good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. So anyway, wonderful, wonderful day. And thank you that, um, you know, I'm really glad that you all enjoyed it uh, as well. It was really cool. Nice. Okay, um, let us then... A message from, from BV saying check Super Chats because there's tons in already. Okay, let's have a look. Let's see what we've got. Yeah, okay. We'll probably turn them off in a minute. Okay. Um, so, welcome. Let us stampede to the Super Chats and see if we can get some questions a-rolling. Indeed. Um, incidentally, we're going to film tomorrow and uh, we're so fizzy with ideas about doing these gigs and having to put rigs together and learn complicated material and uncomplicated material, but having to sing it as well and play it with some sort of gusto in a band. That includes Andy Timmons. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I was okay up to that point. Yeah. <laughs> he just reminded me. Um... We asked. We, we were just wondering what we could do for a show tomorrow that would be interesting and relatively simple. So if you've got any ideas, feel free to chuck them in while we chat yeah, tonight. Yeah, any, any questions that you guys have got that you want us to have a more of a concentrated look at? Yeah, if we've um, got the gear here and we can do it, we'll do it. We figure that maybe just a question from somebody might be a good good format for a show. So it's not yeah. like we haven't run out of ideas. We just need something uh, that we can do tomorrow while we're completely fizzy about playing with Andy Simmons. <laughs> um, Right, first up this week would be Plexico, as always, Duncan. Good day, mate. Hello, mate. He says, uh, greetings, just wanted to say congrats on Friday's video. It was great to see Dan with his boy crush face on. Nice editing, Mick, as always. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not, uh, uh, 
there's no way I can be cool about this. You know, <laughs> no way. Absolutely no way. Uh, Wit Anderson. Hi, Wit. Hey, Wit. Greetings from Hopewell, New Jersey. The excitement in the crowded house was contagious. Looks like it was an epic day. Thanks for sharing. You know what? I've seen, I've seen Neil Finn loads of times, but that's the first time I saw the like as crowded house. And what was beautiful is they played all the old crowded house tunes. Every crowded house song that you would hope they played, they played. They didn't do chocolate cake. No. So, but yeah, because the um, yeah, that's interesting because they could have done it because. Obviously, Liam is a great singer as well. And they've, so they've got that family harmony thing that he's got with Tim, right? Um, Woodface, an album that Neil and Tim wrote together. I'm trying to think, what did they do off Woodface? Because they did When quite I Was bit. You. Yeah, they did quite a bit. But, yeah. But they did so, so Four many. Four Seasons in One Day, is that on that record? Uh, no. F is it? Don't know. I don't think so. I'm I going think... to turn the super chats off because we're getting full up for super chats. If you've super chatted to this point, we will answer you, uh, but we'll turn them off now so that we can get through them all by about 7 p.m. when Dan and I need to go and have meat feast. Indeed. But it was stood there, it was, you know, it was two and a bit hours and it felt like five minutes. It was just floods of, you know, we were both in tears during several points during Many the evening. Many times. And it was just absolutely glorious. You know what's glorious? Being around people again. Yeah. In that environment, they just wanted to embrace the love of the music. It was oh, just wonderful. It was a very um, together audience, I yeah. have to say that. A really, really together audience. Bonded by music. Remember that, Dan? Yeah, I do. Uh, okay. Um, right. Next up would be... Um, this is one of my particular favourites from my vinyl collection. No, it's Swizz871 or Swizz871. Hello. From Australia, no less. He says, hey guys, I'm trying to use the sustainer pickup in my EOB Strat mm -hmm. to get a theremin type sound. Any okay. ideas what pedals I could use to get close? I've got a volume pedal and a Boss synth one to start me off. I would I would sooner have a fuzz than a synth. The, the synth is, is cool. Yeah, if you've if you've got a really nice um, square wave fuzz with a bias control on it, I've actually find that with just the sustainer and the EAB, I get closer to synthy sounds with that than I do going into a synthy type pedal. Um, Remind yeah. me how a theremin works. You've got. Um, what creates the note you put in your hand? Yeah, so you, you go, there's a field that it creates, yeah. and by you interrupting that field, yeah. um, you've got you've got pitch, and you've got uh, volume, basically, depending on where you put this. Um, so the problem you've got with that is, by the time it hits the theremin, presumably it's some sort of sine wave, is it, or some sort of what I'm saying is the the problem with the EOB sustainer is it doesn't have instant attack. And it doesn't glissando like a no. like a theremin will. So you have to let it's unlikely that the guitar will be into instant resonating feedback. You kinda of have to hold the note as you know and let the note do its thing. Yeah. Whereas with the theremin it's kind of instant. So it's getting signal and you're using it. And I agree with Dan, you might be better off with a, some sort of synth wave yeah. generator and then manipulating it in some other way. Because I don't think the attack on the note from the EOB sustainer is enough. Yeah. Like if, if you hit a note on a keyboard, it's like, yeah, it's on, isn't it? Yeah. On and off. There's no, there's no up. It, the sustainer, um, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing thing, but you're absolutely right. You, it's not like it goes, eh, 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 eh. it's not like pressing notes on a on a keyboard. You've got to get a bit of uh, vibration going, and then the sustainer takes over. You know, so interesting, interesting question. Yeah. So Whit Anderson is saying fuzz, whammy pedal, and delay. There you go. And I think because then you get the pitch bend off the whammy, the yeah. fuzz essentially creates your square wave. Um, or, you know, creates your 
consistent note and then the whammy will bend it. Yeah. Because that's what you need, isn't it? Yeah. You could you could get... Um, so let's say you want to play melody all on one string, right? What's that little toy thing with the stylophone yeah. thing? Uh, it's called a... St uh, someone will say. Yeah, yeah. A sty stylo, is it? Stylo? Stylo? Something like that. Um, stylophone, maybe? But you could... You could get us that sort of an effect because you're going up in yeah. in intervals um yeah stephen blake says he'd use a digitech whammy too yeah yeah i yeah. think it's a good show actually yeah. a pitch a pitch bender um good luck twiz oh James. a slide a slide on the on the erb yeah. strat that would work yeah it would yeah it would work it would certainly work going up it's going to be a bit Take a bit longer to grab the note as it goes down. But yeah, slide. Give that a go. Um, James Blessed. Hello, James. Hello, James. Afternoon, gents. Update on the potential tele trade in. I did what any sensible person would do and bought a Les Paul. <laughs> and yes, I still have the telly. Good on you, James. Good man. <laughs> Good, man. Good on you. <laughs> um, Eagle Ray Rob. Hello, Rob. He says Friday's episode was fantastic. Beautiful video. Great conversation. It felt like being with old friends. Marcus, Neil and Liam were so gracious and kind. YouTube Oscar worthy episode. So, Dan, have you got a magnetone yet? Thank you. Uh, I've been looking at magnetones all weekend mm. and I dare say one is imminent. Yeah. Co Coder have got a used one in at the moment. Oh, do they? Yeah. Trouble is, I think if you get one, you're gonna, you, you've got to get a stereo one, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. can't get a modern nah, one. No, no, no. Got to get the proper. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rob, for those kind yeah, words. Thanks, um, it, it will echo your sentiments and say that it's, I don't want this to come off negative about other bands, but it has to be said that the Crowded House entourage and organisation is a very grown-up and civilised place. It's beautiful. Oh, my God. They look after you. Everyone's respectful. It's a lovely place to be. Just let's paint a picture. We get on stage. The lighting guy comes up and goes, Hey, guys. What do you need? What do you need? What do you want on stage? And we're like, Whoa. They organised parking for us. Yeah. That never happens. Never happens. I've done um, on stage videos before where the lighting technician has done literally everything they can possibly do to ruin your video <laughs> on purpose. They were loving the sound guy. I mean, man, yeah, yeah just so, really beautiful, beautiful people. So with um, Neil and Liam's amp, so I was like, I don't want to move your mics, guys, but would it be okay if we plugged our cables into the bottom of your mics? Then we don't have to set up any other mics. And, and he's like, sure, there's a breakout box there. Brings over a loom. Just plug into these XLRs. So lovely. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's just it really was beautiful. Very nice. Very civilised. So, and Marcus, my goodness me. Oh, man. What, Amazing. I mean, to be fair, most techs we meet are pretty seriously cool people yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, vastly knowledgeable. But, um, yeah, what a joy it was to uh, to have him take us through all this stuff. Yeah. What a lovely guy. Yeah. Well, Jake Lusmore says, tell me that's not two Lazy J J20s. Nearly. It's one, one, <laughs> Hello, Lazy J, one Lazy J20. The other cab is a powered cab. So, basically, it's the power stage of a J20 and there's a little breakout section from my J20 so I, I plug a, a cable into it and I've got a J40 nice. if you will it's really good they're really great yeah you could all, you could use that also to do wet dry couldn't you could the only issue same issue with the match this the signal out of that thing is, is crazy crazy hot yeah fair enough fair enough um Ran Zer hello Ran good day mate um White stripes in French pedicures, he says. Some sort of legend. <laughs> Fabulous show on Friday. The excitement was so palpable. I felt like I was at the show. The setup section was fascinating. Yeah. What I like about it is there is a romanticism um, associated with you know, hey man, just plug in your guitar to your amp and rock out, and that's what real rock stars do. Mm. It doesn't matter who you are, really. I mean, no doubt that there will be an exception or two, but when you're touring on that level, it's never simple. No. It's always vastly complex because you need uh, redundancy when power goes down, you need failure, you need backup. 
There's so much riding on a tour like that. Yeah. Do you see their dates, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Holy yeah, yeah. crap, that's hard work. Yeah. And there was, you know, people moaning at us about having to wear masks and stuff. It's like, we know a number of tours that have been shut down recently because somebody's walked in there with COVID. And even though COVID isn't the sort of big threat that it is, or at least in the UK, it's not the big threat that it was, you know, they the, You've got this whole thing riding on the fact that people are available. Yeah. So, you know, a little bit of caution makes absolute sense when you've got, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars riding on it. Yeah, absolutely. And similarly with the gear, you know, it's never that simple. It's all at that pro level, it's everything is so on, isn't it? Yeah. It's a different level of professionalism. But when when uh, I was putting together the first iteration of the Biffy rig with um, Richard, the redundancy rig has to work alongside the normal rig, right? And they need, if anything happens to the normal rig, they need to be able to flick a button and it goes straight over to the redundancy rig. Yeah. They've spent... So whatever the cost was to get the original rig done, which was substantial, they had to do that again and more to get the redundancy rig going and they've never used it. Right. You know what I mean? But they, they have to have it because you're, you know, you're on stage in front of however many things. If anything goes wrong, you can't go, go oh, sorry, sorry, everyone. Just to give me a second to, uh, you know, you can't do that. No, no, no. Um, Phil Hood wants to know if you've tried the new Andy Himmons, Him <laughs> the Andy Himmons Halo delay, the Andy Timmons Halo delay yet. Indeed we have. And it's, it's, Glorious. And he's going to be here next week, so we're hoping if we... Monday. Yeah. It's possible that we'll be able to shoot a video. It's, right. it's looking tight, isn't it? Yeah, well, we could do it Monday. Well, actually, we could do it on Tuesday. He doesn't fly out till Wednesday. Yeah. So either Monday or Tuesday we could film with him. Oh, after the gigs? After the gigs. That would be much better yeah, than yeah, trying absolutely. to do it before. Yeah, okay, yeah. so we'll make the video with Andy. Yeah. He'd be like, giving it all out, would be like, no, mate, it's rubbish. <laughs> Anyway, what could be better? A video with Andy uh, having a look at it. Andy Timmons was our very first ever guest. He was. Yeah. That was still one of the best uh, live recorded guitar sounds I've ever That's managed to record. Amazing. Largely thanks to Andy. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Ran there again says, I got an uh, Earthquaker Devices Park Fuzz recently. It's a glorious through a clean Maiden D, but when engaging a Clon or a Page DS, it gets muffled. What are your thoughts? Where are you putting it? Where are you putting the Maiden? Where are you putting... Oh, hang on, the DS? Yeah, so he's saying he's got the Park Fuzz, Maiden D, and then the DS. So two stages of a Dumble, basically. Okay, so... So you're, you're putting it into a clean, and then you're putting it into an overdrive. And when you put it into the overdrive, it, everything's limiting. Yeah. that's It's the same thing as trying to put any delay or reverb into that sort of limiting. Some people really like it, but generally what happens is... It's a fuzz, park fuzz. Right. It, yeah. But still, what you're saying is you love it with the sound into the clean side. Yeah. But as soon as you put on the, the D and you you then reduce the headroom, you know, everything's limiting as, you know, because you're, you're engaging preamp gain. So the fuzz what you'll be doing, the fuzz will sound darker because you don't have the the headroom anymore. Yeah. What you it's might, a really what, tricky thing. What you might want to experiment with just to test your own theory is turn on the page DS, but turn the gain down and turn the volume up. And what you'll probably find is there's a sweet spot there somewhere. Right. Because if you're using the, the Maiden D in the page DS in the way that I do, you know, you've got your nice clean channel and then you've got nice thick Dumbly overdrive. Yeah. Um, so you might be able to turn the gain down, but then, of course, you then you wouldn't have your Dumbly overdrive. Yeah. Yeah. Just gain staging stuff. Yeah, yeah. Steve Mass. Hello, Steve. Hey, Steve. He says, I finally listened to the Tin Spirits album. That was you, was it? <laughs> and I was very impressed. Ah, thank uh, you, bud. Love the proggy vibe, vocal melodies and guitars. Well done, Dan. Oh, thank you, mate. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Dan uh, was was in a band called Tin Spirits that's being partially revived. The new Tin Spirits. <laughs> the, the new originals. The new, new originals. 
uh, yeah. Yeah. We've got um, Dave is, uh, won't be doing Ten Spirits anymore. Um, but we have uh, Paul Stacey joining us on guitar. That sucks, is, doesn't it? Oh, man. Yeah. I, I mean, just, I mean, you couldn't find anyone good, so you had to use Paul. <laughs> Uh, for for those of you who don't know, Paul is an um, old friend of Dan's, old friend of mine, kind of, um, just having rubbed shoulders for many years. And he is a truly, I mean, A, he's a gifted producer. Yeah. But he is a, 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 an astonishing guitar player, like an, a, like one of those guitar players where you're, you, it's beyond the comprehension for me, Yeah. the way he plays the guitar. Yeah. Like on a book of act level, you know, the, yeah. the connection with that, with music is so innately deep it's hard to understand yeah for me yeah and all the better for it completely brilliant anyways playing in a band with dan <laughs> i mean is it hard work do you oh you poo yourself every time you go yeah. for a rehearsal i mean i know you should you know we always say don't we you should always play with musicians who are you know shall we say beyond your level of step expertise above. yeah step above but not not like a whole postcode above that's, that's yeah, you I'm know. Not, I'm not saying this really see him up there. I'm not saying it relates to you directly. If I was playing in a band with Paul, I would feel like, you know, a, a schoolboy footballer playing in the Premier League when I couldn't really play football yeah. if I was playing with yeah, Paul. Yeah, it's, it's it's I'm not saying that's No, no, to no. You. It's it is a uh it, what's wonderful is any situation like that where you get your bum kicked it can only bring good things. And one of the reasons I love doing this, like, you know, doing these tricky songs and stuff and that we're doing for the Andy Timmons gigs, I spent a Did weekend... Did we say we were doing some gigs with Andy Timmons? Yeah. <laughs> Man. Um, but getting inside the songs and actually, you know, really getting into those intricate parts and learning them, it's... I find that a lot of fun and I find it so great for my playing. Um... And as if you pull it off, if you actually manage to pull it yeah, off, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's a nice little confidence thing. And there's, it is that thing, right? When you're, if you're out there playing in front of people, it's nice to feel confident with what you're doing. Yeah. You play different. If you don't feel confident, yeah, if you yeah, get yeah. on stage and while you're on stage, you're thinking, gee, I should have practiced this more. No. You're, you're you in stop. a bad spot. You can't do that. That's what it's going to be like next Thursday when we do the first Timmins gig. It's like, okay, whatever I haven't learned by now, too late. Yeah. It's just, just play what we know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to learn the end, the end wig out solo, or at least half of it from Rosanna, where he plays that m monstrous bend and then the really difficult pick part. God. It's hard, man. But I loved the thing that you said today where you went, hang on, this is Lukatha wigging out. It's okay for this to be yeah. hard? I was feeling all bad because I couldn't really play it. And uh, I was saying, hang on, yeah, it is Luca third, like hanging it out there. Yeah, man. So that's okay. You yeah. shouldn't feel too bad about that. Definitely. Um, right. Uh, Sam Strauben. Sam Strauben says, hey guys, any tips for how to get usable <laughs> or repeatable sounds out of the hologram microcosm? Any thoughts about the Meris LVX? Hope you both have a lovely week. Thank you, Sam. That's very kind of you. I am... Desperate to get my hands on an LVX. I think it looks absolutely amazing. Is it basically a Meris hologram? It's no. It's a the new Meris delay pedal. But basically all the Meris effects are in there. So you've got your delay side. And then all of the filtering and synthy stuff in the front end as well. So it's like this massive Meris mashup with the most amazing user interface Oh, cool. Really beautiful. They've done. I mean, we're big fans of Mera stuff. We are. I we use their mic preamps actually on for the guitars. When you listen to the show, there's a couple of Mera's 440 mic pre's that we use on the end of our microphones. Yeah. Love them actually. So I can't wait to get my hands on that. Now the microcosm is really interesting. I've actually I've taken it off my board for a couple of reasons. One, I. When it's on there, I can sit down for hours and just muck around with it and play it. And it's so beautiful. Um, but I found that there's... 
I don't know. There's few parts of the set that I'd actually use that sound. I needed something a bit more, I don't know, glitchy. The other thing is the microcosm uh, is there's no analog dry through in the microcosm. So I really struggled using it in wet dry. Um, but saying that, it is the most remarkable sounding thing. Um, yeah, but I'm sort of moving away from just that ethereal texture stuff. I, glitchy and, and broken is, is really nice at the moment. I'm really enjoying that stuff. Um, I find it more appropriate than just being sit down and then create sounds of clouds. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Oh, hello, we've gone off. Oh, camera's out. Um, why is that? Okay, we're still going, Daniel. So if, okay. you could, uh, if you could keep the people happy. Yeah, no worries. So, small camera malfunction. The uh, power wasn't plugged in, but that's okay. Um, hello to our podcast listeners, by the way. So, we put our VCQ out as a podcast um, for our Patreons uh, on Patreon. Our Patreons on Patreon. So, yeah, thank you to all you guys. Patreon on Patreon. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, right. Yes, thank you, John uh, W777. Still hear the audio. There we go. I, so Luke McFarlane says, I said glitchy and broken just as the camera died. Oh, that's awesome. That's brilliant. Uh, Neil Sewell says, none more black. None that's more great. Black. Yeah. Oh, look, there's the logo. That's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Where's the logo? They're so good. Um, yes. We should be back. As my... We're on it. Okay. Yes. Thanks, BV. Yep, we got it. We're plugging the camera in. All good, bud. Sorry, that's what happens when you tear the studio bits to go and do location jobs. You forget to put it all back together properly again. Yeah. <laughs> Still, you know, it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be that pedal show if it was an entirely unprofessional, would it? <laughs> I'm just quite pleased the stream didn't stop. That's clever. No, I'm pleased. Clever technology. Yeah, yeah, please. Very good. Um... The perils of live streaming. The click tracks revenge, says Murphy Murphy. <laughs> That's great. Uh, That's really great. <laughs> We're back. Excellent. Um, yeah, camera's out. Time to switch to the backup rig, says David Metzler. <laughs> Very good. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Um, there we are. Um, there was a couple of things coming in earlier on about band names that was making me laugh. <laughs> Uh, Lawrence Koch says, uh, then we became the Thamesman. <laughs> and Lawrence Holland says, aluminium spirits. <laughs> we um, were going to call something like lead vapours or something. Yeah. But uh, no, it's it's a new thing. It's all, the music's very different as well. Um, so it's called A Division of Labour. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, do, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. It was like an, an ode to um, the old dude with the beard. What was his name? Jeremy, leader of the Labour Party. Oh, what was his far name? Far out. Uh, not Jeremy Hunt. It's uh, uh, the guy that got ousted. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That was what he did, wasn't it? A division of Labour. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember his name. Um, he looked like he was going to be Prime Minister for a minute and then didn't. Um, Dan Herbert. Hey, Dan. Um... It was just, surely his name was Jeremy. Clarkson. Because they kept calling him, Diane Abbott kept calling him Jeremy. Anyway, Corbin, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Poor Stacey and the three others. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. Poor, Paul Stacey and the three others in brackets, not required. <laughs> If you haven't got brackets, it ain't prog, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, Dan... Oh, have you seen the new Pistols um, drama reenactment thing? Sex Pistols. It's called Pistols. Right. It's on some streaming service. I forget which one, but we're up to... Netmazon. <laughs> yeah. Netflix. Um, <laughs> it's one of the best things I've ever seen. 
A dramatisation of the Sex Pistols. Yeah, and how they got started. Oh, great. Oh, man. Who plays John Lydon, then? I don't know his name. Right. But who plays Sid? I, again, I don't know his name. Hello, Sydney. This is the receiver speaking. It's just wonderful. Uh, Dan Herbert. Hey, Dan. Hello, Dan. He says, I love my 65 Princeton Reverb reissue. Great. But I can get irritating, painful high frequencies at volume 7 plus. It goes away with reverb turned off. Ever experienced something like this? Thanks a million as always. Uh, so if what you're talking about is like a parasitic oscillation at high frequencies, um, it might mean that you need to look at your reverb valve. Yeah, that's the first thing I was going to say. Yeah. I think you should call your record that. What's that? Parasitic, Parasitic oscillation. oscillation of high frequency. Someone said poor station and the superfluous three. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Neil. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, assuming it does have a valve-driven sent and return reverb, I think it does. The Princeton there'll yeah. be there'll be a valve um, that's that's for that job. Try replacing it and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. After that. Don't know. Try that first. Yeah, yeah. That what's happening is that basically the send, as that's turning up and the signals, going, uh, the signals, ends up coming from the return back onto the input, and you get this feedback loop, this mm. oscillation. Um, so. Turn the reverb down. Turn, yeah, turn the, and that's why when you turn the reverb down, it goes away, right? So, yeah. that valve should sort it out. Also, what you can try. Depending on the the cables that you are used to attach to the reverb tank, sometimes um, you get those uh, the, like the RCA cables that are joined together. Sometimes by separating those RCA cables, you can also solve that. Oh, really? Yep. So yeah, you've got the send and return, and as Dan says, a bit like this. I'll show you. Um, it might be that you um, you need. Uh, better RCA cables if that's the way you're going to run your Princeton. But yeah. the first first port of call is going to be the valve thing. So this isn't an RCA cable, but you see how it's joined. You can separate it. You can separate it all the way if you want. Yeah. That you know, if you put a new valve in and it doesn't help, you know, give that a go. And it might be that... Um, Could you use a lower uh, gain valve? Because if it's a 12AX7, could you try you, a 12... You absolutely can. AT or an yeah, AU or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. try that. I've n neither of us have ever tried this, so we're not saying that it'll work. Somebody yeah. may have an answer. And yeah, so, and, and Gordon has also said better, better shielded RCA cables. That can, you know, that can help. You Basically, it's an impedance thing where, you, where you're getting cross-talk and any back on the input. So... If you either separate them or get a uh, you know better shielded ones, that can help as well. We've got some hilarious uh, spam in the chat this week. <sighs> I don't know. What's wrong with people, Dan? Inside, they're beautiful. I'm so proud of all of you. Uh, George Radcliffe. Hello, George. Hey, George. He says, I truly enjoyed every bit of Friday's video. Thanks for doing the extra work to bring us special content, content like this when you can. Yeah. The good thing about COVID now being not the problem that it was is that we can now do more of that stuff. Yeah. And it's so good to get out and do it. It's I wonderful. Mean, to be fair, I get stressed to hell doing stuff like that because it's it's production and that does my head in. Like, all of the stress is on Mick. If I'm there thinking about what questions am I going to ask him, Mick's looking after the cameras and the audio and that sort of stuff. So it is... When I, I was talking to Marcus about, you know, he said, oh come down and hang out and I went to what's the possibilities of doing a thing with Neil and he said I'll ask he came back and goes it's on and I'm like oh my god and I thought oh, I've got to call Mick and tell him it's on <laughs> no I shouldn't be quite so grumpy about it it's just um, you know there's there was a time in my life where I'd go out and do stuff like that quite frequently and yeah. you've got everything you know all your batteries and all your rigs and all of that And but then we've become a little bit more homebird of late yeah, yeah. and taking the show on the road is 
we and yeah it's uh and we would have help from simon and stuff like that these days dan are handling pretty much everything ourselves um and yeah but we should don't ever don't do it dan no no is all i'm saying yeah yeah well i'm you know i'm not gonna turn that down but the stress is we don't get two chances at that no 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 we don't know. go oh sorry guys the uh, audio wasn't running can we do that again no it doesn't you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to switch to our redundant systems <laughs> and of course you're in an alien environment as well so absolutely you're dealing with audio that you're not really sure yeah. of and yeah. everything's got to be quick because neil's like he's got a limited amount of time they need to sound check not moaning just saying it is quite a got to get it done you gotta you gotta get it right first time yeah but, hey it's all good thank you george glad you liked it uh oliver boysen says hello leggings dan as you're a massive fan of the deluxe memory man yes have you tried the new Nano version? If so, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So over the years, Electro Harmonics have done a few versions of this. The Memory Toy, the Memory Boy. Um, and, you know, I think, they're, I think they're, they're really good. Even their new versions of the Memory Man, though, they're closer to a Memory Man than anything else that's available. But it's when new. you... Yeah, yeah. When you hear the 24 volt big box one, I spent a day with Ed O'Brien with every imaginable Deluxe Memory Man variant out there, and they all sounded great. The issue comes when you compare it to the 24 volt version. And even, see, the issue is that like our versions don't even sound the same. Um, you know, and they're all, they're all a bit touchy. Yeah. But there is magic in that thing. There there really is. Uh, but however, I will say that I think all the electro harmonics variants of the um, Memory Man do sound great. Yeah. Tough, isn't it? I mean, even um, Marcus was saying they've got nine on rotation. So Neil's got two. Uh, Liam's got two and they have nine so when they break they get them fixed yep. and he said it's just getting harder and harder they tried absolutely everything but they still keep coming back to them so yep. yep yeah tough we should I'm interested to try the new EHX one we don't do nearly enough EHX stuff we should do more yeah because they make such great stuff and it's always well priced yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, we should do more we should do more um Cheers from San Diego, says Jeff Harvey. San Diego. San Diego. <laughs> the meaning of which has been lost over the years. <laughs> I'm a fan of the large headstock duo jets. Oh, yeah, come on. I'm in the minority, I know. Any advice on what to look for when hunting one down? I will upgrade the pickups and wiring for show. Um, Was this the, the... Are you talking about a vintage duo jet? Hmm... Let's see. So they went to smaller headstocks. Um, sounds like... Uh, right, so Fender took over the marketing and licensing of Gretsch guitars in the early 2000s. And some changes were made. Right. And I've just found one on Reverb that says large headstock pre-fender so i'm going to put two and two together and suggest that perhaps fender changed some stuff and then made them upgraded them and made them i don't know right better yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah i hmm. so let me let me rewind uh there was some great japanese gretches made through the 90s, I distinctly remember those. A lot of the reissues. Okay. They yeah. did some sparkle jets. They did... Yes. I remember those sparkle jets. They were great. Some cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so, but it's at this point, I'm going to say, I just don't know enough about it to know really what the differences were. I know that when Fender did get Gretsch, I think Mike Lewis took it on. Mike Lewis is, uh, at that time, I don't know if he if he's still there or what, mm. but Mike Lewis was someone that had overseen the classic series project when they started making the strats and tellies and p bases and j bases in ensenada mexico and mike is an absolute detail obsessive and 
did such a great job on that. He then took on Gretsch and did an utterly fantastic job of that. Yeah. So that's that's what I do know. I know that once Fender did get hold of it and really put some attention on it, the guitars got really, really good. What I don't know is how different they were before that, really. Yeah. One of the best guitars I've ever played in my life was an old, uh, like, orange sparkle. It wasn't gold. It was definitely orange sparkle duo jet that was at Vintage and Rare in Denmark Street. And it was the sort of guitar that I just sort of melted over. And, and, and the sound of it plugged in, it just had everything. Also, there was a country gentleman there from the same year was an absolute disaster. Yeah. Um, the black duo jet that Neil has, which he, you know, uh, had on stage with him, astonishing sounding guitar. The, the issue that I got with the old the older Gretches was they were really hit and miss. Yeah. Well, same with any Same with any. Yeah, any absolutely. Guitar. Absolutely. But I think over the, because they're a hollow body guitar, I think over time... Um, they had to be looked after. Uh, I was doing some work with Charlie Birchall and he brought in a bunch of his old White Falcons. And same thing, some of them were, oh my goodness, mm. what astonishing guitars. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like you've really got to look after these, you know. Yeah. yeah, I just don't know enough about it. Yeah. So I guess the the answer to the question is if it's priced well, you can buy it on spec and sell it on if you don't like it. Right. If it's priced, you know, ambitiously, then you really need to play it. Right. I guess. Same with all guitars, isn't it? Yeah. Same absolutely. With all guitars. Absolutely. A couple of strat questions. Um, HM wants to know, Mick, have you tried the Klopman strat pickups? I have. They're in my gold custom shop strat and I like them a lot. Yeah, great. Um, funnily enough, I was in Germany just recently and um, spent most of the evening with... Uh, Andreas Klopman and had an utterly fantastically enlightening conversation. Loads of stuff I never knew before. What a nice dude he is. And I reckon loads of stuff that you've forgotten after that evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was quite a lot of booze involved. Um, you know, like all of those people, I, it, it's probably worth just balancing that out a little, a little bit. And whether you're talking about Klein or Klopman or Ron Ellis or... You know, any of those boutique builders, Matt from Monty's for that matter, yeah. you know, they really, really, really know their stuff and you always learn something hanging out with them and, and having a chat. And yeah, I love that. Anyway, I particularly like them in that guitar. They seem to work quite well. I was halfway through making that vlog and then everything went crazy and ended up with two other strats to answer the question from Jack Bowles. Hello, Jack. Is the gold strat, the big headstock, newly acquired? It is. I bought it off Ainsley Lister. Um, it's a 70, and um, it's just a totally mega guitar, original pickups. Why don't we do that tomorrow? Why don't we go through your new straps tomorrow? Come on! It's just, I, I flipping love this guitar. I did a gig a couple Sundays ago, and I played it for the whole set. Yeah. <laughs> so the aforementioned Rosanna thing, where he goes... Uh, and he does that mad bend. On these massive frets, it's just all of a sudden you're going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, flipping love that guitar. It's a great guitar. Don't it's get me wonderful. Wrong. I love the 61 as well, but it's got it. It needs a bit of work. Um, and I'm reluctantly loving jumbo frets. Oh, nice! Just because you can like. Yeah, ah. yeah, yeah. I know. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, we could do strat stuff tomorrow. It just needs a bit more care. It needs detail shots, and it needs it needs Mick pace. Yeah, I. We can do the takes to... ages. Okay, but okay. We need to get some in the can tomorrow. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's gonna take me a week to film that. Okay. Um. Although we could do part of it. We could do the bit where you're involved. Yeah. 
the tiny little bit at the end. No, no, no. Because I'll do a walk past in the background. No, Dan, I, get out of the shot. I want. I really want Dan in it because you know a sort of a second opinion. Well, no, but now I've made my mind up. But I want to know if I'm crazy or but not. But see, the thing that I think would be really interesting because you know I'm because my body is so twisted around this flat piece of wood, and I, your knowledge of strats is so amazing. I'd love to just come in at like fresh and go and just. Go yeah. through them and think that the, what really struck me is that not, I haven't done many gigs just lately for obvious reasons. And I s- kind of, s- you start when you sat here on this stool week in, week out, everything's really comfortable and easy. And so, yeah, the Les Paul and I love it and 335 and all mm. these different guitars. And you can really do it. But when it when it came to showtime, doing a gig, front in a band, singing, everyone's kind of on the edge of their seats because there was only half a rehearsal and stuff like yeah. that. It's like Strat every day of the week. Yeah, yeah. Because I am so in tune with that guitar yeah. and I know where it all is and I know I can make it do whatever it needs to do at the appropriate moment. And the experience of that compared to being sat here on the chair week in... You, any of you that do gigs, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. The second the band starts, everything changes. Absolutely. So being comfortable at that point. And I was thinking about this when you were talking about the microcosm and stuff earlier. Yeah. It's like in that environment, I'm always going to simplify. Yeah. Always, always, always. And just go for what's required. Sure. And that'll be... So one of the things we we were talking about doing was um, documenting the process of putting our rigs together for the Andy Timmons gigs because, mm. I mean, all right, it's a bit self-indulgent, but it's also blooming interesting about the thought process absolutely that you can relate to putting your boards together when you're going to do your gigs yeah um because it i definitely i definitely go for a simplification model at that point sure like nothing superfluous yeah that could be interesting yeah i think so hmm. anyway sorry <laughs> we just see our rigs for the gigs <laughs> it's like oh, i'll simplify i have you okay fair enough <laughs> Certainly oh. mine. I've gone, I've gone fully, midi world. Oh, have you? Yeah, I, can't, yeah, I just yeah, yeah. can't. I can't do it. I've got to be. Able, I've got to concentrate on singing. So the guitar's got to come second. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but the thing is, by doing that, I don't have to think about it. Yeah. All the sounds are there, ready to go. Yeah. I've got a different song per bank. Everything's, you know. Oh, have you? Yeah. Ah. Okay, just to make it really easy. I think we should, yeah, but see, that would make it much harder for me. Oh, okay. Because I wouldn't be able to remember what bank is what. Okay. And the minute I can't see a light that says on or off, right. I'm out. Okay. I'm done. That's why I like the CXM78. Yeah, yeah, right. Because when I look at it, that's what it's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no hidden anything. Anyway, uh, okay, I think we should do that. Okay, great. Sorry, massive tangent. Sorry. Um, sorry. Let's be very English and apologise. Um, yes. Uh, Krampus CT says, Chris Cornell played a late 80s orange sparkle duo. He jet. did. Yeah, I'm going to associate him with that, actually. Yeah. Um, Oldwood Smells Good said, I believe it was the custom shop strat that took the beating. Yes. Yes, it was. Yes, when the... When the uh, wah... Mick was rocking so hard that the walls were shaking. It threw the wire off the wall. It was great. Yeah. Made it while I was tapping out. That's it. I'm gone. Just <laughs> just jumped off. Um, Oliver Boysen says, um, Mike is head of a custom shop now. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Mike Lewis. Uh, we've got a spammer on. <laughs> um, Reese Jones wants to know, can you use a QMX to replace the amp foot switch? Uh no, so the, an amp foot switch. What you're talking about is having uh, like a contact thing to replace, you know, channel switching foot, you know, or turning on and off the reverb. The QMX is audio, um, but it's an interesting idea being able to bypass the audio of the loop and turn that into an isolated remote switch. I'm going to think on that for a bit. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. You can use any either latching or non-latching, depending on what the amp requires. Yeah. So if you get bot something like a Boss FS5, that will do Absolutely. the job. Because yeah. it's got a bunch of switches that will enable you to make it do the job you need mm-hmm. it to do. Um, now, uh, C 
So QMX can't, but G3 and G2 absolutely can because they have, what do you call it? Dedicated isolated remote switches. There you are. There you go. Yeah. So in G2 or G3, for example, if you, you could add that to one of your presets. So if you press button three, that could turn five pedals off, five on, change the channel of your amp, reroute from whatever, do, do all of the above. Indeed. And do some MIDI stuff, which astronauts understand. <laughs> um, PD wants to know guys much love from Wisconsin I've been crunching your vids looking for an explanation of the ideal forking off point for a stereo split for a two amp setup with a stereo phaser post tone pre reverb delays and so forth mm. we have done a couple of stereo shows um, it's a pain stereo is a flipping pain it, it is. It is. It, it is, but it can sound absolutely marvellous as well. You hear, um, I mean, anyone that's gone to see Andy Timmons live and Andy has his stereo delay, that's the only thing in the loop is a stereo delay. And actually, I think I might be using a stereo reverb now as well. I need to double check. Um, but everything else is going straight into the front of one amplifier, send comes out into the stereo pedals, then left and right go into the return of both amps. And he makes it work so beautifully. You know, stereos are, can be a hard thing to, to get your head around. Not to get the head around, but it's really easy. It's like, oh, stereo, and you get these massive ping pong delays and reverbs and that sort of stuff but as soon as you put that into context in a band thing it's like it goes out the window and yet Andy manages to get to build these soundscapes in yeah, that environment yeah, yeah. and makes it really work I mean you've got to think the other thing to remember as well Andy plays loud yeah so you know he has two lone stars on stage and he makes sure that all that stuff is coming out the front mm. actually when I was talking to him last night he said um do, oh, do you know if the line stars have got 6L6s or real 34s? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, oh, I need to bring, I'll bring a, court, a double quartet, octet of EO 34s. Oh, uh, right. So he said, I just... Uh, Mine have got 6L6s. Yeah. He said, I can't make the 6L6s work. Too much bottom end. Right. Probably. Right, okay, there you go. Um, one's a 112 and one's a 212, by the way. Okay. So I hope you won't have a problem with that. And the 212 is currently being repaired. Okay. So uh, it's all fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, anyway, on the subject of amps, Subro Pontes wants to know, what are your thoughts on beam blockers, like the Weber ones? Uh, I love my AC30 CC2X, but standing in front of it is like being stabbed in the face. Uh, two steps on either side, and it's absolutely glorious. RIP front row. I think the beam blockers can work great. Yeah, I would... They're a pain in the butt to put in. And depending on how you put them in, they don't... Bear in mind, so if, if you haven't seen it, if you imagine a guitar speaker and then when you mount it in the... The beam blocker is basically like a strip of steel and it's got a little thing in the centre of it. And that fits over the front of the speaker, between the front of the speaker and behind the grill of the amp. And what it does is it takes the beaming cone of the center of the speaker and it disperses it in a sort of diffusion manner now one of the issues is that least little piece of steel has some thickness so depending on what speakers you're mounting in you can bend the frame of the speaker right one would assume that the bit of padding stuff around the edge of the speaker will take care of that and take up the slack so just be aware of that i'm sure this is a common problem i'm sure it's something that weber um explains on their website but you don't want to be bending the frames of your, of your nice speakers number one yeah number two they're a pain they're a pain to put in and take out you might just be better off with a baffle board yeah and there are some really interesting baffle boards out there as yeah. well yeah take check out the deflux ones the de yeah. that's what i was going to say yeah they they're like an angled piece of perspex that uh have this v-shape on them and you and you you slide it underneath the amp 
and it sits in front of the speaker, but it reflects the sound yeah. out. It's really clever. Yeah, they're quite good. And it might be just less hassle than having to take the speakers out of your amp. I did have beam blockers in my 2x12 Lone Star, and I think they worked. I couldn't really tell. Um, and I think I took them out because in one of the more interesting things I've ever said, I like being stabbed in the face when it's the appropriate time to, to have that. Please, if there are any psychopaths watching, disregard that last comment. Um, but I like the directness of the amp for certain sounds. I get what you're saying about the AC30. You know, certainly if you're playing it clean, it can be pretty yeah, um, pokey. But once you get it overdriving, you kind of want that. I, do, I wouldn't want to lose that. So, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Maybe try a... a a, either a deflux thing or just some straight perspex uh, screen. So many people use them. Yeah. So many people use them for that very reason that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, David Rustad. Hello, David. Hey, David. He says, I'm three times happy this week for your heart exploding show on Friday. The puppy we got on Saturday, Embla, same name as a pedal. Nice. Nice. Uh, and for the Empress Phaser, the best phaser. DM Pup Canada. Cheers, ankles. Nice. Nice Very one, nice. David. Oh, puppy. I I part of my heart is melting, part of me has got PTSD. <laughs> yeah, but you can't compare Rosie to other puppies. Oh, I think you can. Well, maybe maybe to other spaniels. <laughs> yeah. Um she is the most amazing dog and I, and I love <laughs> Spending time with her, and she's and she's because she's calmed down now a, a little bit. bit. <laughs> but I remember when you first got her, and she was just an absolute whirlwind. And we never had that with Ziggy, right? You know, because he's Ziggy is bred to sit on a lap and look adorable, <laughs> and there's nothing he likes more in the world. <laughs> but Rosie was was a blur for the first few months. Oh, mate, I just. And I could see your, I could see the cogs turning your mind going, oh my goodness, what have I done? Yeah, yeah, it you was. Know? It was. If it wasn't for the stoic um, pragmatism of my amazing wife, I would have struggled. Yeah. Well, and now yeah, you yeah. can't imagine life without her. No, no, no. I can't, She's I the can't. most well, amazing we're dog. We're even talking about getting another one. <laughs> the, right. Um, uh, anyway, congrats, David. I hope you have fun with your pup. It's funny, you know, because when she's all grown up, I'll be like, oh, I really miss the puppy days. <laughs> oh, you won't. <laughs> Bimo Adiguna Putra. Bimo Adiguna Putra says, Mick, Dan, wonder what you think of the chilies. That's in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Are you a fan? Have you listened to the new record? What do you think of Friscanti's playing and tones? As always, cheers for the videos. Um... I haven't listened to it. I haven't either. Um, I gave up at Californication. Right. Because I love the chilies. That the Blood Sugar Sex Magic and everything around it was like... It was a pivot point for me right. in life. And if you throw 10 by Pearl Jam into that mix... Nice. Uh, never mind by Nirvana, although I wasn't such a Nirvana fan. But anyway, the part of the movement that was happening in rock music around that time. And to talk specifically about Frascanti, he is as important to me as SRV in discovering Hendrix. Oh, wow. That's big. And I have endless admiration for his guitar playing on that record. And then, I don't know what happened next, it all went weird and i was like yeah i don't like this anymore and then i've sort of never been back so okay. but you're not the only person who said check it out um that this album is mega and his playing is mega so yeah, yeah so we should do that i i be, from what i i've heard the whole thing is done on tape there's no digital processing at any point um until you know it has to be from the tape the master I think up to the mastering point, I think it was all done analog. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Um, yeah. I, I, John's actually using one of our quarter masters in his board at the moment. Is he? Yeah. So wow. all of his, but, but he's using it in a really interesting way, right? 
all of the pedals are plugged into the quartermaster and the quartermaster is basically underneath his board and it's there as a redundant system so if any of his pedals go down they can just oh, they take, can turn it off turn off oh right yeah great um but uh, yeah i am i'm gonna have a listen i'm gonna have a listen is it the is it the under the bridge intro ding da, 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 ding 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 is that under the bridge yeah right loads of compression yeah so, uh, and uh, when I first heard that sound, that's probably, great. Probably doesn't finger it like that, but yeah, that's. I mean, but that is really beautiful guitar playing. I mean, how Hendrixy is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There goes our copyright strike. <laughs> I used to be able to play that. Forget the chords. I'll stop. Um, Bev says, my friend Brett Papa and buddy Panos are in the chat. Hello. Thank you for joining us. That's lovely. Ah, mm. uh, yeah. Again, the wrong chords, but uh, just fantastic guitar playing on that record. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, we've got this. Someone is, someone is uh, spamming. You know, some awful sex stuff, and um, Jason Carter's come in with. I think I'd rather pay for Tinder at this rate. <laughs> That's brilliant. Can't you just? Can't we get rid of these people? How do yeah. We... Um, um, BV's going in there and... Can't you just ban the user from the channel? I've no idea. <sighs> what are he's, they, he's, what already, do they... he's already done all Yeah, he's just trying. I don't understand how they can still be... Um, They're just bots though, aren't they? They're, they they yeah, just... but how do they... Surely you can just remove... I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that they're not adding to society in no. a meaningful way. Oh well. Um, Buzz Cromhunger says, uh, did Dan meet John? No, I've never met John, but you've met John, haven't you? I don't think I have, actually. I don't think I have. Maybe that's why both of our lives are shallow and empty. Could be that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John W777 says, uh, no real question, just a small contribution as I recover from COVID after teching a couple of festivals here in the South. Can't keep this old dog down, he says. Cheers and thanks for everything you do. Thank you, John. That's very kind Thank of you. Thank you, mate. That's lovely. We Thank hope, you. Hope you're feeling okay. Albus Band, Aaron says, this promoter in the Midwest has pulled out St. Louis and Kansas City and Des Moines. <laughs> I don't know. It's in Indiana or something. <laughs> he said, sorry, last week's quote through you. Here's a nice easy one. I wondered if last week's quote might be best in show. Right, but I don't know. You, you you can let us know, Aaron. Thank you for that. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. It's, yeah, it's not a big, it's college, not a big town. college town. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas Gellner. Hello, Thomas. Got that much talent. <laughs> that much. They were still booing him when we came on. Um, oh, man, I just I had so many questions to ask him. I, re I want to know how much of that was improvised. Yeah. You know. It is so flippin' clever. You know, one thing I want to do. I want to do a that pedal show um, spinal tap viewing party. Nice, where we watch it without the with you know with no audio, and we're just wetting ourselves and quoting it. See, see thing. who can do it. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. that'd be great. And just yeah. and get everyone to to join in. We'll do it live. Yeah. And get everyone and we'll and we'll count down and we'll start at the same time. And so everyone can join in. That'd be brilliant. Maybe we could see if Michael McKean and Christopher Guest want to come in and sit on thrones as part of the um promo for the new movie. <laughs> sit on sit in pods. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Little girl, it's a great big world. Uh Thomas Gelnar. My gain comes mostly from my amp. Nice. I want to use delay, etc. Uh, after the app, I'm thinking about cable management. When I have my board with the Boss ES8 on the floor and cables, etc., running to the amp, any thoughts? Um, Thomas, you need to research something called the four cable method. Yeah. And what you know, what you have is essentially four cables going 
to and from amp. So one goes from your guitar to your input. The second cable goes from the send to your input on your effects. The third cable goes from the output of the effects uh, back to the effects loop return. And the fourth cable goes from the output. Fourth cable is a guitar cable into the input. Uh, it's it's guitar in one, from there, two, there, back there, three, back there, four. Find a diagram. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's really simple without me trying to explain it. And that's normally what happens is when people do that, you either make up a little loom um, of all your cables together so they can all sit together and some people might advise you against that. So there's a pedal snake that can work really well, but if if, if you've got... Um, there's some really simple wraps that you can get, right? If you've got all your cables and you're like, okay, this is this is the thing, this, this is, is what we use... You just get these wraps and you start wrapping it and then you've got your own loom. Yeah. It's really simple. Yeah. Um, you could use little cable ties. You don't want to do too much because if you've got a problem, taking it all apart is a pain. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't you, really like cable ties You don't that. want to over-tighten it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there's tape. Don't use tape no, because no. then it will all go sticky. Gross. Nobody wants that. Yeah. Um, yeah, cable management. What was it you said? The snake? The pedal snake. Yeah, check out the pedal snake. That's really good. Yeah. I used one of those for a while. Yeah. Great. Uh, first post says Johnny T. Hello, Johnny. Hey, Johnny. I've been here since the beginning. I just wanted to say thanks, Legends, for all you do and have done. Oh, I, mate. I had a great birthday. Ah. <laughs> Johnny, yes, we did you a message. Didn't we? Oh, happy lovely. Birthday. Oh, lovely. Nice one. Happy birthday, Johnny. Yeah, happy birthday, mate. Amoeba Teen. Hi, shoe fillers. I love hearing your philosophy on life and living, which prompted me last week to wonder how Mick is doing with the black dog. No, not Rosie, the black dog. Thanks for all you do. Um, thank you for asking. I'm doing great with it. Funnily enough, I was talking, Catherine and I were out for a walk with the dog yesterday and uh, we were talking about it because we have a mutual friend who is suffering. And um, we, we were just talking it through me and her and I was saying, it's quite frustrating being in this position now. I feel like an ex-smoker who's telling people not to smoke. Because yeah, I kind of worked out what works for me. Yeah. And when you can see people making the mistakes that you've made, or at least making some of the choices that you've made, it can be a frustrating experience. But of course, it's no good telling people that. It wouldn't have been any good anybody telling me that. Mm. Because I had to you have to go through it and you have to make a decision that you want to be well. Yeah. And that's the tough part. That's the really tough part. But thank you for asking. I'm doing great. Um, I've worked out a bunch of strategies and things that uh, help me be happy, actually. Yeah. I can, I can attest to the difference, not only that you've that's made to you and your journey. But the difference is made to me as well because you've been an amazing sounding board for my own stuff going through. And it's been, yeah, it's been really wonderful. Mick, Mick has got, you know, he will, when you're, when you're researching something, you know, for example, when you're learning the parts for these songs, you go to the absolute nth degree to nail it. And you take that same approach with everything that you do, right? And when you're when you're looking at the the whole mental health journey, you approach it in exactly the same way. And you went so deep with your you didn't just read one book and go, oh, I've got it sorted. You you started looking at, at Lyrian stuff and then you just went like and and what was really interesting is all the different parts you went down to have a look at, they all basically funneled back to the same thing. They funneled to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and that was the that was the interesting bit. The, the, what turned it for me, and I'm, I, for once, I don't for one second want to say this is a case for anybody else or that it would work for anyone else, but what worked for me in shorthand is I realised that it wasn't something that was happening to me. It was something I was choosing for myself. Right. So I just had to work out how to not choose it and it was as simple as that and it was um 
two and a half years of studying that, practicing it, and then, yeah, kind of getting to the point where it's managed. Yeah. And actually, I don't want to be too... Um, <laughs> the trouble with any mental health issue, especially something that is stress-related, is... It's a bit like trying to keep out a leak. Yeah. It'll find another way. Yeah. And I've been surprised over the years at the ways that it that it finds. Yeah. So I don't yeah, say yeah, yeah. I've kind of beaten it. I don't want to say that. It's, it's a, a bit like being a recovered alcoholic, I yeah, guess. Yeah. It's a daily decision, right? It's it a is. daily get up and you renew yeah. that every day. And what I would say, that's not a struggle at this point. It's right. not a hard daily fight at yeah, this yeah. point. It's actually you... easy. Yeah. Yeah. But if I stop doing it, like if I didn't walk the dog, yeah. if I didn't have this ability to step aside from my mind and go laugh at it, that's that's the, the, the key tactic is you find yourself getting into a position of negativity, you look at that and you just step aside from it and you, you go, what are you doing? Yeah. Mind, why are you trying to control me? Yeah. And you just laugh at it and you say, no, nope, you're not in charge, I am. Yeah. We'll, we'll make a better decision. So thank you for asking. Um, I have thought about making a video on it, actually, but it, I'm a little bit concerned it would come across smug or like I've got all the answers, which I definitely, definitely don't have. I I think a podcast where we sit down and chat about it, because it it's a big thing to cover, and I think especially for musicians and artists, it's something that we need to be talking about more. Yeah. Um, and it's something as... You know, as people who are, you know, generally sensitive and uh, they use that sensitivity to express themselves, they're uh, susceptible to the, you know. Yeah. Like, I don't know any artist that doesn't have massive highs and lows. Yeah. You know. So I think it's my important. My problem is that I became identified with it and it was starting to become an excuse for not doing things. Oh, wow. And it was starting to be it was becoming a part of who i was and i'm like nah that's not that's not the case i don't sure. want to be that and it was a choice to be that so yeah thank you for asking sorry too much of a tangent um and amoeba teen if you are suffering with any of that stuff then we wish you the best yeah uh in in finding your own path to something a better place yeah yeah so for... at the risk of a flippant comment one of the things I woke up one morning going was, hang on a minute, I am going to be dead in a minute. Sure. In, you know, in historical terms, we don't live that long. Some people are fortunate to live long and happy lives and some people don't get, get there. Whatever the case, whether you live to be 125 years old is not that long. Yeah. And I promise you, once you start getting up there a bit more, and I'm only in my late 40s now, but it just starts going. And I'm not scared of it going. Yeah. But I don't want to waste any more time. No, no. no. I've just I'm done with wasting yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. It's like you just enjoy and be happy. There's no reason not to be. These are all song lyrics now. I'm gonna I'm making notes. Thanks. Dan. I'll go back to revisit this part Thanks, of the Dan. show and I'm gonna write those down. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm gonna get preachy. I'll stop. Um, B Samp says hello. Have a nice glass of wine on me. Oh my God, B, that's incredibly generous, and we will do exactly oh, mate, that. Oh thank, thank you, you so much. Um, thanks for continuing the continuing inspiration week after week. I just got my first American telly and I'm hooked. Now just waiting patiently for my mule caster delivery at the end of the year. Oh, yes. Wow. That is cool. Very cool. Very cool. That is cool. I have looked longingly at those, actually. Mm. You never, you would never think, would you? It was certainly the case with true art guitars as well. You know, a, a steel-bodied instrument. You, you'd think electric guitar, obviously... Dobros and Nationals have been around for years, but you'd think that that could never work. And they often sound really cool. I, I was watching, uh, Paul Stace was playing at the 606 in London, and it, you know, it, it, sounding awesome. At the end of the night, he pulled out his, um, his two side uh, telly, and everyone just went, whoa. It was spectacular. Was it? Oh, man, really did. It was a. It still had a classic sound. Yeah. There was definitely something else going on with it. Yeah. You know, man, killer, it, killer guitar. It does rather. We had some interesting comments after last week's um, Q and A, where 
one of the questions that came in was about, you know, how, what, how does wood affect tone in guitars? And we sort of danced around it by saying that, that it, there are a number of opinions on this and there are a lot of people who really believe it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. And there are some people who know that it does make a difference. And the question is, what is that difference? And somebody came on, and I apologise, I don't have your name to hand. They were a vibration... Um, oh, that was fascinating. ...analyst. Yeah. And put a... Uh, a view forward that I found fascinating. It's not, it's not what the wood adds to the tone. It's what it takes away, right? Which is a really interesting way of looking at it. So if you do what, um, what's his name, Lil uh, Wayne, Lil, something like that. The guy that did the video that it does Wayne. It doesn't. No, it's something Lil Jim Lil. Right doesn't make a difference whatever you attach the string to it's going to be the same sound i mean it's, it's just palpably not true so yeah. however he made that video good on you but it, it it flies in the face of every professional guitar maker player and who's ever existed so i'd love to see the production of that video anyway anyway if you string as les paul did uh string a string along a piece of railroad track something that's largely inert compared to a piece of wood you get one sound if you attach it to a piece of wood he liked the sound of it by the way attached to the railroad track it just wasn't appropriate wasn't practical yeah you attach it to a bit of wood and it's not what the wood is doing to the tone it, it the, the the thought came in it's what it's taking away right. and different um maybe different densities and vibrational characteristics and harmonic generation of the the sum total is taking aspects of the string vibration away not adding to them and I thought bloody hell I've never never thought about it in that way so we know it's a contentious subject um I've had too many guitars to tell you that it makes a difference Dan yes, you mate. replaced the saddles on that guitar recently how much difference did that make I can't even tell you how much difference it's made there you go it's astonishing and there are people who will tell you it makes no difference yeah I just don't get it I don't get it um, Richard F says it's the frequencies that the wood absorbs that make the difference. Yeah, Richard, I'd never thought about it that way before. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, um, Deja Voodoo. Great words, Mick. Your mental health story is well worth telling. There are too many life coaches and thinkers and gurus that have a vested interest in this area. Your honesty is refreshing. I reluctantly agree with you. I reluctantly agree with you. I said to Catherine yesterday, I think therapy and stuff is fantastic. Gets you to the start point. Yeah. Gets you to the to the start line. Yeah. At which point is your race. Yeah. And I think if if it goes don't get me wrong, some people with PTSD, psychosis, you know, not just a bit of mild depression, very very serious um physiological mental illness. Yeah, yeah. of course, that's a different matter and I yeah. don't want to conflate the two things. Um, but in my case, if you carry on with too much of that stuff and you listen to too many of those people, you're handing them the responsibility. Mm. You're saying, this is your problem, fix me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually what you need to go is, this is my problem, I need to fix myself. And that's the that's the Rocky Balboa running up the steps moment. Yeah. Adrian! <laughs> yeah. It's also, it's also that thing... I mean, I've experienced it myself when I can remember having through periods of super stress and through periods of very low stress and trying to remain unstressed when you're not stressed. It's really easy to take that advice in when you're not feeling the stress. The difficult thing is when you're actually in the fire. When yeah. you're living it in that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and that's when it's the work. That's overflow. It's wood for the trees. All that stuff. You, it's very hard to process anything sensibly when you're in that moment, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't. Um, Ed Airfire is on. Um, Ed, hello, hello, Ed. Hope you're well, mate. He says, um, idea for a challenge video. The f what is the first step up from your first pedal board? So, for example, take the affordable boards and replace the pedals with something different. Interesting. Yeah. 
it's, it's a really nice idea. Actually, a lot of the ideas that have been coming through are about, you know, a, an eye on budget, which makes sense. Yeah. Not least at the moment. I, yeah, OK. Trouble is, it is vast, isn't it? It is utterly vast. Yeah. Because we're going to say the best upgrade you can make to a budget pedal board is sorting your power out. And everyone's going to go, boom. <laughs> I didn't come here for common sense. No, I didn't come here. To... <laughs> um, and I'm not poo-pooing the idea, Ed. I think it's a great idea. Um, let's have a think about that. Yeah. Let's have a think about okay. that. During Meat Feast. During Meat Feast, yeah. Um... DNM, Michael Gilberto. He says, I didn't see you in London last week. Uh, we're sorry, we missed you, Michael. He says, thoughts, please, on how a band mix seems to swallow up some of one's tone. Pub gig, no guitar front of house, amp set in awareness of band sonic space. Thanks. I've been thinking about this, actually. One of the things that I've sort of realised is that your rhythm sound probably needs to be a bit quieter than you think, and your solo sound, your solo sound probably needs to be twice as loud as what you think it needs to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like to have the to have the guitar. We're talking about dynamics and, and levels and things, right? And most of the time in a band mix, and everything sounds really great guitar player steps onto solo can't hear it. and you can't hear it and so it's either you get the guitar that's probably a little bit just a little bit too loud in the normal section they step on extra gain and the guitar almost gets sucked back yeah into the mix which is exactly what happens because you lose all your dynamic yeah it's counterintuitive to what a lot of sound engineers will want from you you don't have front of house in this situation but quite often a front of house will or at least I've been in a lot of situations where front of house want you to have the same level volume and they'll worry about the mix. And I'm like, just no way. Yeah. Because by the time I'm on my seventh bar of that really important part that I've spent weeks learning, you look up from your comic and you haven't put me up in the mix. So no way. Have a listen to the solo in Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> right? Guy starts off playing the guitar solo and then like halfway through the fourth bar, he gets turned up. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a solo now. Yeah. And let's just put that up a little bit. But it's not there in the start, you know. With, with you know, with due deference to sound engineers, because their job is, well, it's hard, isn't I'm it? I'm never doing it again. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've done quite a bit of it. <laughs> it's, it is hard. But I think the answer is... is you know, it's everyone's responsibility in the band, A, to play dynamically as a band. And if you... So some of it is about how you play. Mm. And I always find with um, most of the bands I've been in anyway, the mixes are always way too busy. Not everyone needs to be playing all at once. I mean, yeah. if you stick on a record, quite often when they're singing, in the music I like anyway, there's very little else going on apart yeah. from bass and drums. A bit of picked guitar, maybe. I remember when I first saw Jim Miracle in Australia back in the 90s, I think there was 11 people on stage, right? <laughs> Sounds like George Clinton. <laughs> Most of the time, it sounded like there was three. Yeah. That everyone just had space. In their pocket. You know, it was like, ah. Oh, so I think that's amazing. I do think that's part of it. It's like, you know, as a band, if you're all playing the right parts, it, it really shouldn't be a problem. Then there's a then there's a technical aspect of, of EQ and all of that. And depending on what kind of gear you're using especially if you're using mod digital modeling gear, there's always a preponderance to way too much bass, yeah. too much high treble and not enough cutting mids and upper mids. And you can afford to lose a tremendous amount of bass from your guitar in a live mix. Similarly, what you'll also hear is just mud everywhere. Everything is contributing to the mud, including the sound of the room. Always amazes me. You look at somebody's live desk and the vocal mics. No one can hear the vocals, and the bass is like 
all the way there. Mm -hmm. You know, for vocals, you really need to push 3 to 5K with some aggression. You really need to push 10 to 12K with some aggression. How much sibilance was on Neil's? Amazing. And then you can hear it and cut that bass because you just don't need it in a yeah. vocal or in, in many vocals. It takes too much energy. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean... I don't mean get rid of it all but certainly you don't want anything much above 80 hertz in a in there's I, a reason I, the neve desk has those yeah i minded to say on anything in a live in certain live mixes so removing the mud from the whole band can certainly help but i think ultimately it's about playing with respect to one another and just playing the song with the correct parts i had a great privilege of playing with some an amazing band a week or so ago keys drums bass me on guitar and singing and backing vocals and it was just there was so much room yeah so everyone good. was in their pocket and it was it was it was wonderful oh, i was loud as hell no one said it was too loud not not a single person said it was too loud yeah. i had the two rock cranked and um uh, Marshall Vintage Modern with the master volume there. Amazing. And it, I, well, no, not a single person said it was too loud. So. Um, BV, thank you, mate. He says, maybe it's time. Please uh, hurry up. No, he's saying, uh, don't forget about uh, Patreons and the giveaway and that pedal shop. Yes. So um, just to say massive thank you to our Patreons. We, every month we do a pedal giveaway for our Patreons as well. Uh, this month it is... Do we know what it is? Uh, isn't it a... It's the JHS, JHS. Um, Bonsai. Bonsai, that's the one. JHS Bonsai we're giving away this month. Uh, and also, a uh, massive thank you to our American <laughs> friends that have gone to thatpedalshop.com. Com. Yes, please go there. Buy things. It helps us. Indeed. Jake Lucemore says, you were too loud, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jake. <laughs> um, he does say it was it was a great mix. You were too loud. <laughs> Happy days. Um, I just thought, why is this naked HD XYZ still on? I mean, surely how can't? I think we could all take a bit of, uh, you know, naked HD XYZ is, um, shall we say, has got a. Uh, a plan and is not giving up yeah you know um, and that sort of tenacity yeah i think we can all take something from that um james bird mick did you refret the gold strat or did it come with jumbos either way can you elaborate on the choice um both of the gold strats came with jumbo fret 6100s or thereabouts what is, what's interesting is here's what's interesting about that if you've got low action yes and small frets so this is relatively vintage style frets and I can't get the action high enough at the moment for various reasons. Okay. And what happens is I've just got more flesh in contact with the fingerboard, right? Okay. So when you get to bending, especially if you're doing your... It, it can be a bit tough on the old fingers because mm. you've got so much... In, if you've got ham-fisted technique like me, you've got so much flesh in contact with the fingerboard. Now, what's interesting about jumbo frets is two things. You you can play a little bit lighter, right. as Ing V knows, because you can get your note, and I've got nowhere near as much flesh in contact with the fingerboard. Because Therefore, the frets are higher. Because the yeah, frets are yeah, higher, yeah. right? What that also means is, because the frets are higher, your action can be higher. Because you don't have to push them down quite so far to the fret, right. but they're further off the fingerboard. Oh, interesting. So it enables me to play with the kind of aggression that I like to play with. Mm but without having to get my fingers stuck on the fingerboard. And you can do all those bends. Anyway, so I'm, I like him. Yeah. I like him. Yeah. 
I used to have a trouble internetting on bigger frets, but I'm past all that now. <laughs> Intonation is for people who are worried about being in tune. <laughs> I've got I got Lucas of vibrato in my in my mind now. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're definitely not for everyone. But having got the seventy Strat and just loving playing it, mm. loving playing it. My secret machine says hi D &M. Any news on when you will visit Bukovac in the states? Can't wait for that one. Um, we will get there. We will get there. Many many reasons. Many many reasons for us to visit Nashville. Um, I've just been seeing some builds from the guys at XTS. Exot yeah, XTS boards. They've done a build recently for um uh yeah. Just a bunch of them come through and they just they look absolutely amazing. And they also do a mod. Who are they? Uh they're 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 like uh Bradshaw type company, okay, in Nashville. Yeah, nice. Um, they've just done a bill for Andy Wood. Yeah, and their work is astonishing. Um, so, yeah, certainly love to visit those guys when we're out there. Um, and you know, obviously, oh man, hanging out with Tom Bukovac talking about guitars. I can't think of a more fun that you could possibly have in a day. Tuesday was pretty good. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> That's very true. Um, Gary Varner. Um, hello, Toes. Do you still have the Jazzmaster and Jaguar? Feels like forever since they've been on. Uh, and will the worm ever be fixed? Much love from Indiana. Easy question first. The worm has been fixed. Um, Zach from Mythos did his best. It's still a bit noisy. Um, so maybe we should revisit that. Uh, there's only so much you can do, he said. He, he replaced a few bits and... Did his best, but uh, it's pretty agricultural in there. Yeah, yeah. Part of the part of the sound. Yeah. One of the things with some of these pedals is the way they're filtered, or the the way they're not filtered. And electroharmonics, I think, generally don't like to filter a lot of stuff. And they can be a bit noisy because of that, so but it's also why they have got a sound the way they do. Yeah, it's very cool. Bizarrely brilliant sounding modulation device. Let's use it tomorrow, Dan. Okay. In some way. All right. Form or shape. Um, Jaguar and Jazzmaster. Um, Dan never bonded with the Jag, unfortunately. It it. It really needed some serious setup work, and we just never got around to doing it. Simon put flat rounds on it, and that really helped. It helped, but it's you just you're just not happy on any guitar apart from a telly, are you? Is the truth? Yeah, I there. Will, I'm just was trying to go through guitars I'm going to use for the gig, and I think there is one song I'll play with the Les Paul, and one song I'll play on the Junior. Everything else is going to be telly. telly yeah. Um, and I'm I'm good with that. I'm good with trying to get as many sounds as humanly possible out of this thing. Yeah. You know, I'm okay with that. Well, it does it, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm going to play um, Strat, Les Paul, and 12-string, I think. Yeah, you are. But yeah, um, I really did like the, the Jazz Master, and I was going to do something to it. Change the pickups, maybe. Um, and then we had to tidy up because we had to put all the guitars away to get the kit in, and a load of stuff went in back in cases. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? But that's the truth of the matter. Mm. And um haven't been minded to get it out again. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Everything's a phase, isn't it? It's all It all goes in phases, and there was a moment where I didn't really want to play Strats, so I was playing the Casino a lot and Gibsons, and then now I'm just completely in Strats again. Yeah. And Dan's never really been out of telly, so... Yeah. Interesting. It's like they're there for a purpose if we need them, but we haven't stumbled upon that need just yet. Yeah. 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 Paul Matulovic. Hello, Paul. Hey, Paul. He says, curious about your cable preferences, instrument cables. Uh, he's talking about, though I did find the patch shootout Dan featured in to be quite interesting. Yeah, so instrument cables. What instrument cables do you like, Dan? Short ones. 
Um, silver flex ones. I've always liked uh, the Megami ones. Um, We've got these nice ones from one of Marcus uh, Reeves' friends, and I forget what the brand name is. Oh, yeah, they're great. Uh, um, well, it's Van Damme cable anyway. Yeah, the Van Damme cables are really great. Which is a lot of OEM stuff. Yep. Oh, God, I wish I could remember the dude's name. Well, now I feel bad. Um, Mark, James, Paul, uh, but if I was gonna Keith. Go, if I was going to go out and buy an instrument cable tomorrow and multiple Quinton. thereof, I would buy these, which are the Klotz LaGrange. Kenneth. Klotz LaGrange. Yes, they're great. Yeah, my my favourite cables, apart from my various Providence and Frieda Tone ones that I've got. My favourite cable is an old George L cable that I've had for 20 years. Is it? It was red, is now pink. Actually, my favourite cable was my Megami um, with the silent jack, but it broke just recently, Right, which is really annoying. Oliver Boyson says, is Dan's t-shirt a new design? Check that out. It is. It's in this orangey colour, and we also have it in black. We do. Yeah, in the store, that pedal show store dot com, right now. Uh, in two colours, two colours for your delectation. Yeah. Um. So, Paul, what do we like? Um. I don't like really short, really low capacitance cables, mm -hmm. and I don't like really long, really high capacitance ones. Yeah. Those two extremes, not for me. I like a between guitar and amp. What have we got? 15 or 20 foot to pedal board, 20 foot to amp, bunch of stuff in the middle. And at that, you know, if you're running 40 foot of cable, you want that to be, I want that to be relatively low cap. Yeah. Now, there's plenty of other people that like really high capacitance cables because of what, you know, the high end they lose over the signal loss. If they if they have really bright amp, for example, or the bright switch on, or they just want to lose, they want to take away some. I'm not a massive fan of that, yeah. but there's plenty of people down the years who are. So as an experiment, if you can stomach it, pick up a 10 foot super low capacitance cable. And what are we talking about there? 70 picofarads a meter? Yeah, if that. 55 maybe i don't you don't often oh, see perfect. yeah yeah i'm thinking perfect yeah yeah you don't see a much lower no, than no. 70 per no, meter no, no um and then a real and a higher one which would be 150 plus per meter mm. peak of farads um and do the former as about 10 feet and do the latter as 40 feet and just listen to the difference yeah even without any pedals in in the the game it makes a massive difference yeah Depending on which guitar, if you're running an active guitar, it won't make too much difference. But yeah, um, if you're running a normal passive guitar, it will. Yeah, look, I said normal, and it'll make more difference on humbuckers generally than it will with single coils. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah, everything, everything matters. Yeah, <laughs> I'm minded to quote Bob Geldof in one of the best string adverts I've ever seen. String for adverts for rotor sound strings. All right. Bob Geldof's quote was, these are the best free strings I've ever had. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, and it is a bit like that with cables, I suppose, because they are expensive. But anyway, Klotz LaGrange. If I was going out to buy some cables tomorrow, I would buy Klotz LaGrange. Great. Um, I just picked up my first vintage guitar, says Doug Pogliano. Polygano. Polignano. Doug Polignano. Right, what'd you get? Just some junky old 63 Strat, he says. First vintage guitar, 63 Strat. My goodness. He says the shrinking pick guard has caused the pickups to shift to a slight angle. What are your thoughts on replacing an original part like a pick guard and maybe moving to a five-way switch? What are your thoughts? This is the sound of my face palm. Depends what condition it's in, Doug. Yeah. If it's all original and it's never been touched, you will be hurting the value of that guitar significantly by changing anything like that. Mm -hmm. I suppose you've always got the option of just taking the whole assembly out. So the thing that affects the one of the things that affects the value of some of those old strats is how much the um, 
electronics have been monkeyed around with. So if it is highly likely that it's had pots changed or bit had a couple of repairs done over the years, if that's the case, five-way switch, yeah, I don't think you'd be in too much trouble by doing that. If, however, it's all pucker, not been touched and is original, then you would be ill-advised to change it for the resale value of it. Yeah. As for the shrinking pit guards, obviously very good sign that it's right because that's what happened. Um, celluloid nitrate pit guard, they shrank over time, that's why they crack, particularly at the screw holes, and they can make a difference around the um, around where the, the pickups are. This one, 1961, original. There you go, look at that. There's some signs around. Show me the beveling on yours. So this is now this is a 65, right? I had all gone wrong by 65. They're all gone wrong by 65. Is yeah. That, yeah. Different material. Right. Because it's all wonky. I mean, it's all. Yeah. Still, I guess they still shrinky, shrinky. Um, and you can see where it shrunk. Yeah. Yeah, and cracked. Normally, it cracks here. Right. And here. But um, yeah, I wouldn't, if it's all pucker and hasn't been changed, I wouldn't change it. If it's been messed about with, then change it by all means. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, 63. Mate. Flipping but, great year for strats, I think. Yeah. They can sound really pokey and lovely, 63. That's still the best strat I've ever heard. Yeah, it's, ma it's mega. Yeah. It's just totally flipping awesome. <laughs> Uh, um, lucky boy. Um, Elias Bloom. Elias Bloom. Uh, I'm mulling a custom jam multi-pedal. Oh, nice. Tube Dreamer, Rattler mm -hmm. and Red Muck. To pair with my light speed for all gain and distortion needs. What should I be keeping in mind? They are classics, those circuits, and Jam have done an amazing job. I think that's a you know that's a really nice combination. What I would keep in mind is, I don't know with the multi pedals if you can change the order of them. I don't think so. So what I would be keeping in mind is you might be able to get multiple jacks. Right. Okay. I don't know that, but um, so what I'd be keeping in mind. <sighs> so you've basically got. A muff, a tube screamer, and a rat. There you go. So think about whether if you're going to use combinations of them, um, then the order is super important. As a rule of thumb, we like to put the lower gain, the pedal that you're using for lower gain sounds, at the end, closer to the amplifier, and the pedals that you're using for higher gain sounds closer to the front. Um, yeah, but yeah, there must be, I wonder if there's some, if you can change the order internally or something. Um, so just be, yeah, all I'd say is just be aware of the order that you have them put in the uh, enclosure. But I think it's, you know, their multi-pedal things are fantastic. Yeah, they're really cool. Really, really cool. We love Jam. Obviously we do the Harmonious Monk with them, but their work yeah. is just we had a lovely chat with them, and they're saying, "When are you guys coming back over?" Soon. Soon. Oh, I'd love to get back over there. We have the we've been over there a few times, and we have the best time with those guys. And they're good humans. They're good humans. We spend most of our time wetting ourselves laughing. It's truly wonderful. The biggest laugh was, "What do you mean you want to do a harmonic tremolo? No <laughs> one's going to buy that. Everyone falls on the floor laughing." <laughs> Yeah, but we could call it the Harmonious Monk. Okay, let's do okay, it. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Paul Matulovic again. Hi, Paul. He says, so the split ends tie-in leads me to wonder, what are the Kiwis? Besides Paul Crowther, are there any bands of note? Um, Dave Dobbin. Flight of the Concords. Flight of the Concords. Come on. <laughs> Lord. Oh, so Neil Finn makes cameos in Flight of the Concords. <laughs> <laughs> where the manager calls him. I think one of the guys had left the band. 
and the manager calls Neil Finn and Neil Hess goes, man, he's got my number. He goes, I'm never mind that, Neil. So I've got a question for you. Would you like to audition for the band? <laughs> no. Apparently uh, Keith Urban is a Kiwi. I thought he was Australian. I thought he was Australian too, so that's a surprise to me. Lord? Uh, New Zealand-born Australian. There you go. Okay. That, what, what, how does that work? Well, immigration between them. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, quite, okay. Um, um, yeah, it's, I mean, we're on Wikipedia now, obviously. Yeah, yeah. There's a um, bunch of great Kiwi bands. Yeah. I remember. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, Maori music as well might be interested if you're interested in world music. I suppose there's quite a bit of that. There, yeah. I mean... Uh, Microtonal chanting, apparently. Um, I used to play with uh, a couple of Maori musicians in Australia and they're just absolutely wonderful, wonderful people. Um, you know, the guys I've played with. It's just so flippin' musical. Um, and, yeah... There was a, actually there was a band. So I was in a uh, so cover function band. How bizarre! How bizarre! Do, 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 do. OMC. Apparently they're Kiwis. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I was in, yeah, and in, uh, in a function band with a very dear friend of mine, Leighton, uh, who was a really amazing frontman bass player and lovely Kiwi, and he his band called Alive had come over from New Zealand to play all the walkabouts they were fantastic really great uh, breeding ground for musicians as is Tasmania actually um, part of Australia a little island on the south yes they make Blundstone boots there my favourite footwear right I play with some amazing musicians from Tasmania yeah nice yeah nice Tassie do you call it Tassie Tassie yeah. Yep. I'm like a, I'm like a local Dan. Uh, James Colunio. James, we have a super chat from you, but no question. Let's see if BV has mailed the question. Ah, Paul meant pedal brands, not bands, from New Zealand. Ah, pedal brands. Ah, so we're talking about Paul Crowth, Paul Crowth, and the Hot Cake. It wasn't Red Witch? Are they from New Zealand? They might be. They're either Australia or New Zealand. I'd be really impressed if you get that. Redwich pedals. Mm, contact. Mm. Let's see. Oh, pop ups, man. Pop ups. No. Don't know. Okay. Don't know. In the area, in the general area. Yeah. It's all the same anyway. Isn't it? <laughs> it's not. It's not all the same. Um, Have you ever been? Australia, yeah. Not New Zealand. Right. The New Jefferson Zealand. says yes. Red Witch. Red Witch is from New Zealand. Yes. There you go. There we are. Great. Um, and uh, Electro Harmonux. <laughs> That was a really bad gag. Uh, sorry, BB. Don't make the six drive. <laughs> the six drove. The six <laughs> um, And the hot chops pedal. Uh, B BV says um, Autobots just reroute where they're sending from, so it must be an IP thing, mustn't it? Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, they slightly change the name each time. So, I mean, Flux effects are Kiwis. So I didn't know that. Boring, isn't it? Marcus Reeves. Marcus, thank you. Axe Custom Cables. Axe Custom Cables, Paul, is what we were looking for earlier. Right. Axe Custom Cables. And we've been super impressed with their stuff, actually. Yeah. They're um, cream and white coloured, and the cream ones are the ones that are uh, board to amp, slightly less flexy, and the white ones are a bit more flexy, guitar to board. Right. And uh, we do like them a lot, so thanks, Marcus. We also should mention the Evidence Audio um, ones that are supposedly directional we've been using them for years although one of them's gone walkies yeah no idea where that's which gone. is weird it'd be in a gig bag somewhere for yeah. sure um axe custom cables axe custom cables thank you marcus hope you're well mate um right 
Oh, God. Lars Lildahl. Lars Lildahl wants to know the passive effects loop in Matchless. How do I address the, address the tone suck? Don't you don't. So, so I measured the voltage coming from the EF86 channel, the day channel, the Matchless, and it's like 36 plus volts. Um, the amount of headroom that you need. I mean, if you if you're that's with the gain turned up, right? If you're using it as a dirty channel, you could if you if you're running it clean, you might get away with it, but you would need a specific uh, effects loop sort of buffer low impedance thing that sits on the amp. Um, it's a really tricky one. Uh, if you use the clean channel and the effects loop from the clean channel, it's fine. It's, it's like normal. But the dirty side is just like, it's impossible. And there's nothing, even if you do get that sorted out, what you'd need to do is then, once you've got the Lampedus thing, you need to reduce the level then that goes into the pedals and then make the level back up as it goes back into the amplifier. Um, so, you know, a dumbbellator type thing would do that. But it's, yeah, it's tricky. It's very tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll, you'll get a slight frown whenever we talk about effects loops because we just don't really use them. We like They're Dan, super inconsistent. Dan and I prefer that to have the amp just on the edge and then do everything else in the front, but we totally get that doesn't work for those of you who like to run your amps with more gain in them. Yeah. And yeah. then you do need an effects loop solution. And it's why all the players down the years have had so much trouble with trying to make that line level thing work or instrument level and why the amps are so inconsistent. Some loops are definitely better than others, um, but of course the more stuff you put on it to make it work, the less good it potentially sounds. Yeah. And Dave just... Free the, the loops that Dave Friedman makes are my favourite sounding effects loops. Yeah. He just they're proper instrument level. Yeah. You know, and so they just work with any, anything. They they're just really, really, really great. Um Neil Sewell. Hello Neil. Hi, he Neil. says Awesome show. Neil Finn is a hero of mine. He's also why I have a double cut Gretsch Duo Jet. Any idea what pickups are in here as they don't look like normal filtertrons? Cheers, Neil. Um, I don't know. It was a... Unless it's been modded, it was like it was an old one. Yeah, did he say it was a 58 one or was it newer than that? No, it's a... 70s yeah. one no no it's it an old one like a, like a 50s one yeah so it would have been whatever yeah um, if you're a Gretsch fan Neil you will know that they've changed the pickups quite a lot over the years so I would suspect a Gretsch uh, forum or something would be a better source of information than me or Dan yeah you should be able to tell though I mean we looked at the guitar you should be able to see from the video and identify them um, I, yeah I just don't know enough about yeah about Gretsch pickups, sorry to say. Um, but we're glad you liked the video. Thank yep. you. Uh, David Metzler. Um, David says, I just got a PRS Core Hollow Body 2 with Piezo or Paizo. Oh, okay. If you're in the They're quite thick, those guitars, is that uh, right? America. Um, hollow Body 2. I don't know. There's a Hollow Body and a Hollow Body, and one was like that, and one was like that. Yeah. Um, have you any experience or advice running wet dry with an acoustic amp? AER and a Fender Deluxe Reverb. Nice. That's a great question. Yeah. So, um, one would assume you've got dual outputs on the guitar, one for the piezo pickup and one for the magnetic pickups, or it's a TRS so it's split and you can split both off to wherever you want them to go. Mm. I would imagine it's the kind of thing where you might not necessarily want both things on all the time. So if you had something like a Radial Big Shot or a um, Dan's AB Baby, you could choose whether you had both one or the other. And I think that would be a good place to start. Yeah. Because it might be, you know, if you're going for a nice overdriven sound, you don't necessarily want a plinky piezo in that you might do uh, or if you've got a cleaner sound and you want a nice you know some nice electric guitar chords with some uh, piezo sounds then that would be a good thing um, 
So I would say as a start point, make sure you can have one, both or the other, and a, any decent ABY switch will do that. Yeah, totally. Have you ever tried anything like that? Yeah, so when I was... Um, uh, my dear friend, uh, John Wesley, who was oh, well. playing guitar for Porcupine Tree, and he had a system like that where he would have to switch between this piezo and the, and the normal pickups in his PRS. And we just had a system that he would... The output from the PRS would go into a little box, a little isolated box, and then it would be switched from a remote switch in his G2. So he just hit a button and the amps would mute, and then he just had the acoustic thing, so he'd go back and forth between it. And I think the sound from that PR because he had he had the PRS thing as yeah. well, it sounded yeah. flipping fantastic. Yeah, yeah, lovely guitar. Give that yeah, give it to a, a decent sound guy, a decent desk. It's like wow, really did sound yeah stellar. Um, but doing the wet, I don't know about doing the wet dry thing with the acoustic. Um, I haven't had any experience specifically with an acoustic thing, but switching between the outputs and stuff is a really cool thing to be able to do. All the, you know, the the approach and the theory remains exactly the same as yeah. doing it with two electric amps. So yeah. I guess it's just get your hands dirty, plug a bunch of stuff in, and 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 see what you like. The the as he was alluding, the issue is with the transient difference with a piezo yeah. pickup and a magnetic pickup especially under distortion the distortion is not, probably not going to sound great with the piezo pickup it might do people have used it but talking about sort of classic sounds so you'll get that weird thing but i would have thought for certain uh rhythm parts and maybe even various picked melody parts you could apply different effects to each different side and get some really interesting yeah cool sounds one other thing that might be worth looking at is something like um Dan makes a product called the Wetter Box, and you can, with an external foot controller, um, continuously move between the two signals. Mm. So you could have them both on, one on, or, the, or one completely off. That could be a good way of doing the ABing as yeah. well, because yeah, yeah. that'll do the same job as an AB switch. But you get all, to blend them in. You get to blend them. That could be quite a cool thing, actually. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Good mate. luck. Nice guitar. Yeah, they're great. Do you remember the? Um, uh, Godin? The No, the Godin is another stellar. multi ax Really great. Yeah. Um, but also the Parker Fly. Oh, God, yeah. And I remember seeing... Who's the guitar player that replaced John Frusciante the first time? Um, uh, Dave Navarro? Dave Navarro. And he was using one on a TV show with, with the Chili Peppers. Mm. And it sounded great. Didn't Reeves Gabrels use one as well? Yes, yeah. And and also, uh, Mel Haggard had a really weird one that looked like a telly. Um, that was an odd day. Uh, Ex King Crimson Blue, uh, Adrian, Adrian Blue. Blue, yeah, yeah. And it's been his main guitar for years and years. Has it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. loves them. Nice, nice. Um, good. Uh, let's see, um, Michael. Groton Hewis, Michael Groton Hewis, maybe. He says, DNM, thank you for providing the inspiration for me to build my own TPS wet dry rig with a Victory V40 Deluxe and a VC35 Deluxe. Cool. Come on. Um, only problem is the tremolo on the VC35 has an audible tick. Any ideas? Yeah, something in the whatever's doing the. Doing the wobble. Making the wave is getting caught in the audio path. Um, yeah, so the questions are... Victory's customer service is astoundingly good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I would definitely start with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, th so the questions to ask and the information that you want to go to Victory with is does the app make that tick on its own or does it only make that tick when you're connected the apps together? Is one app isolated? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. With it's really interesting, right? With problems like this, you'd be stunned what can what can make that noise. If you've got uh, like a biased tremolo like that, and there's some noise on the earth, it's just you know it might be something that doesn't appear to have anything to do with the amplifier. So process of elimination, you know, does it tick on its own? Does it only tick when you've got the two amps going? 
um, are the amps properly isolated? And you want to take that information. When you email customer support, make sure you give them all that information. Yeah. Don't, because they will come back and ask you these things. Yeah, yeah. That's a, you know? that's a good shout. So make sure you have the information and you give that, and then they'll be able to come back and say, okay, yeah. we think it might be A, B, or C. Yeah, so does it happen when you're not wet drying? Yeah. Is the, is the first question. Yes. Good luck, Michael. Um, yeah, other than that, Todd Roy says, Porcupine Tree has arguably one of the best drummers in the world. Uh, well, although I hate saying things like that, Gavin Harrison is unreal. Quick quick Gavin Harrison story. Uh, he was doing Stephen Wilson, was he? He's, the... Yeah, he was Porcupine Tree. He's also in King Crimson. Yeah. Um, and he's, yeah, he's, Porcupine Tree are doing their reunion tour. Right. But originally, uh, when I was doing this, the gear for um, John Wesley... He said, um, uh, one of the crew guys is going to come past. I was doing a gig in Watford and I had some gear for him. He said, one of the crew guys is going to come past and pick it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries. So anyway, the tall guy walks into the gig and he says, oh, you know, you know, I'm, you know, here I am at the Watford walkabout playing the gig. I'm pretty cool. <laughs> you know, he walks in and, and, and he said, oh, here's the gear for Jonathan Gray. And we had a chat. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, you know, I'm in the band. We're playing, playing some Aussie tunes. And he's like, oh, that's really cool. You know, we had a chat for about 10 minutes. Lovely guy. Anyway, I turned up to the next um, Porcupine Tree rehearsal, uh, sound check, and I thought, and I'm looking around and he goes, and I saw him up tuning the drum stuff. I thought, I thought, I must be the drum tech. (laughs) And then I thought, that's cool. And then I hear this, I hear these drums and my head just, like, splits. I couldn't, and of course, it it, it was Gavin Harrison (laughs) getting to come in and grab the stuff and is like... (laughs) Uh, the whole time must have been just thinking you idiot that's the true double edged sword of being a drummer isn't it by and large nobody knows who the hell you are that's the downside the upside is you can walk down any high street and nobody knows who the hell you are yeah yeah but he is the most astonishing drummer yeah yeah god was it when we did the Albert Hall thing with Stephen Wilson was it, he was playing them wasn't he 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 was he guested did he yeah he came and played for a few tunes yeah yeah um, right, Luke McFarlane. Uh, no, Eric Zenhausen. Eric Zenhausen. Hi, Eric. Thanks for all you do. And not just on pedals and gear. I'm going to see the Brothers Landreth in New York City tonight. Thanks for oh, bringing them Oh, man. Yeah, they're on tour. How cool is that? Amazing. <laughs> I texted Joey yesterday. He hasn't got back to me yet. I'm not feeling the love. I texted him to thank him. He did. He, he charted me out a song that I was struggling to work out, a Ray Charles strong song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which we are actually going to do in the TPS band. Um, and I just I texted him to let him know that I'd done it at the gig and it went really well and it was great and to thank him. And he's like, great, I'm on tour. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, who else famous did you text this week, Dan? Anyway, hello, Leggins, says Luke McFarlane. I finished a new board today, Strymon Zuma Power Supply, custom cabling the lot, and a new fuzz, Stone Deaf Fig Thumb. Oh, yeah, nice. That's into a crank Selma with an octave pedal. Huge Ooh. noises. Ooh. Greetings from Guildford. Very nice. How lovely. Interesting on the Selma. So Thorpey's just done a, a pedal that sounds a bit like a Selma treble and bass, apparently. Yeah, the Scarlet Tunic. Yeah. Yeah. We should get a listen to that. Um Paul Stacy is a big fan of the old Selma amps, isn't he? I think. I think most producers I know are big fans of those yeah. amps. Um, when, man, name drop horn was working overtime, but I remember being in the studio with, with Biffy, and I'd never seen one before, and he had one sat there, and plugged it in as like flipping heck yeah. they really have a thing cool thing yeah, yeah. They're, they're one of those amps I mean they're not cheap but they're, they're certainly at the affordable end of vintage amps I don't know what the circuit is we should look into it yeah um, if you want another name drop the last gig I did with Robbie McIntosh he turned up with a Selma trouble and bass and proceeded to school me for the next two hours <laughs> get a bit of this <laughs> in every way possible um, yeah I'd love to have him on the show. He's such a, well, fabulous human, wonderful guitar player. A- astonishing guitar player. Yeah. Uh, Sergio Martinez. 
Um, howdy again, gents. I have a brown protein coming. Nice. My current board is a Greer light speed, uh, as an always on, and a Henderson RC booster, booster yes. for my solo boost. Will Lovely. the protein render the RC redundant? Won't render the RC redundant, no. No, it won't. No, not at all. I think what you've got there is a really nice collection of shades of grey, man. Yeah. Um, and you can just mix and match. And I think if you have the discipline to keep all your gain stages low and play just that little bit cleaner than you might want to, but then stack them up, what you start to get is a really lovely, harmonic, responsive, musical place to be mm. where you can just have a bit more time with everything. Yeah. It's a really great approach. And I think all of those pedals that you have lend themselves really nicely to that. You know, you, you haven't got a rat or a metal muff or something yeah. like that yeah, on there. Yeah. What you've got is really nice, shapey, boosty things. I've got this... Uh the sound for the soul and everybody wants to rule the world and I've got my uh, trouble booster going into the page going into the cogmeister nice and because that, they're all you know it's just just sort of ticking over yeah the way they stack is like oh, oh, such oh. a great sound yeah yeah it's great whereas and if I had any of those dimed it just wouldn't work. You'd never get the because no. the, the the pick attack is so clear. We're, we're talking about tears for fears. Everybody wants to rule the world. We're doing the the song in in the band next week. Um, just great guitar all the way through it. It's astonishing. And uh, I think we we think a, a guy called Neil Taylor played the solo. I think mm. I think, um, and it's just a fantastic tone. It's so hot, and I don't mean hot as in. Um, gainy i mean it's hot as in bright and present yeah and yeah really first good. take that solo first take yeah it's a beautiful bit of playing it really is astonishing it's funny i i always think i can and robbie played on that record as well actually i think um i always think you can hear uh, the music of that generation i always think you can hear alan murphy influ yeah right influencing everybody <laughs> wow I, I might be doing nearly a disservice there but it's funny, you know, I, I, as, so I was born in 1974, so I would have been, you know, in my mid-teens in the mid-late 80s, and the music of the 80s just sounded like saccharine rubbish to me. Right. And I hated it because I liked rock. But I listen back now to a lot of that stuff, and the guitar playing is just majestic. Oh, man. And the sounds, it was such a great era of, of fantastic guitar solos in pop songs wasn't yeah it? and it was also an era of real tonal exploration yeah and i loved that yeah i don't know what year that was actually it might be might be later than i think it is but um uh songs from the big chair got to be mid 80s is not it yeah i'm gonna say 84 let's have a look Why, come on, why, 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 why? 85. There you go. Yeah, near Bang. enough. Near enough. Um, oh, Astro Villa says, just saw Tears for Fears in Houston. Flipping fantastic. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, yeah, they reformed, didn't they? Roland, well, they both look awesome. Kirk, Kurt, Kurt, just looks like this statesman. And, right. And Roland just looks like a, a cool man of advancing years, doesn't Lovely. he? Our Gordon Rankin says, heard it live two weeks ago. Tears of Fears was excellent. Nice. Nice. I wonder who's playing guitar on the tour then. Yeah. I wonder if it is Neil. Might be. I think he toured with him. Uh, Paul Matulovic. Hello, Dana Target demographic. Oh, that's too much. Something to do with socks, I think. Darning Dana socks. Tie. <laughs> Leggings. <laughs> uh, but did, did, you must spend all week coming up with those <laughs> he says recommendations for a good travel board mine has no case and would be a bit cumbersome mm. uh, I really like those Daddario Expand ones they're great they don't they're expensive and they don't come with a bag and I think the bags are expensive but I do think you could um, improvise with the bag I'm a big fan of the uh, retailer TK Maxx. 
which I th- you find anything in there. Which I think in the US is called TJ Maxx. Um, <laughs> okay. And you can literally find anything in there. Like right. my cart that I used to, to wheel my cab over long distances from car to venue. TK Maxx. TK Maxx. Amazing. Yeah. And sometimes they have all manner of bags and holdalls that might just be perfect for a pedal board. And then you've got the thrill of the find as well. It's like going on, you know. When we used to do the um, the VCQs in the car yeah. on the Monday, and Mrs. I know where we're going to do it. Meet me outside TK Maxx. <laughs> <laughs> we'd we'd get there and like we'd always have a wander in. Yeah. And Mick would always leave us something camouflage. Yeah. Um Yeah. Or you or just you'd find a random thing. It's like that's the most brilliant shop in the world. It's brilliant. <laughs> Jason Carter says, I agree with Mick about 80s music. It sounds good now. Or perhaps that's because today's music is so bad. <laughs> the War on Drugs are my favourite band. I think it was it was it was when you could put a really So what I think happened in the 80s was it was the arc peaking of what I always call Beatles style songwriting. Right. You know, classic in key chromatic songwriting with melodies right which yep. we can not doff our caps in a big way to the beatles for mm-hmm. and the bands of that era and i think you hear that resurge in the 80s so you know 70s rock all went a bit rocky didn't it yeah I mean, don't get me wrong there was well, a punk was a massive uh rebellion against that actually remember you were talking about uh what was it um on on ice what was that show uh Slapshot? No, no, no. The Dancing on Ice. Yes, keyboard player. Rick Wakeman. Rick Wakeman. The, the oh, my thi- old mate Rog. Your old mate Rog. Who's sadly but, no longer with us. But, but there's footage yeah. of that on the Pistols thing. Is there? It's And it's like, no way. So we're doing, sorry, this is a massive tangent. We're doing Owner of a Lonely Heart next week by Yes. And Yes was one of Rog's favourite bands. My dearly departed friend, Roger Newell. And... Rog, there is a point to this, I promise, had the first ever triple neck bass made by Wal. And there's a picture of him doing King Arthur on ice. And he's got these massive shoes to insulate him from the ice because he can't move around with his bass because it weighs about four tonnes, bless him. And I think that bass, the, the point of the story is I think that bass ended up with Chris Squire. Oh, wow, OK. I think is, 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 how, is the story, is how right. it transpired. Anyway, Amazing. um... Yeah, hang on, what were we talking about? Best King, of the 80s. King Arthur on Ice. King oh, the Arthur. 80s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was saying to Dan, God, this would have been Everybody Wants to Rule the World song is weird chords. <laughs> God, it's, it's all over the place. And he's like, um, is it? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, um... So D, right? And then when it goes into the breakdown, two, three, three four, four, three, two, two three, three, four, five, five, one. What other songs do we know that do that? Didn't you? Didn't you? Bob Dylan. So many songs are just straight major chord yeah. progressions. Bob Dylan was a massive influence on Tears for Fears. <laughs> You're going to hear it in all this stuff. For the times you wish you had a harmonica handy. <laughs> oh boy. Hi. Some people start asking if the tuning is off in that song. It's sped up. Yeah, sped up. That's what I thought. Yeah. They, they listen to it and the producer went. It needs to be a bit faster. Needs to pace. Yeah. And I reckon it's they just sped it up. Yeah. Is that true? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon that's what happened. That was quite a common thing that happened in, in years ago. Absolutely. Uh, it does make you feel a little bit better when you try and play that flipping solo. Um, anyway. Uh, 
Jet Wash Mist. Jet nice. Wash Mist. Nice. We've all experienced that. Gents, I've taken the plunge and signed up for my first Blues Jam. Lovely. Well done, mate. The first time I played live, my fingers were rubber. Any tips? I've got the set list. Oh, man. You, everybody watching, if you've done a gig, you will know exactly what this feels like. Yeah. You've done the prep. You're playing everything really nice. The gig starts, and it's like someone else's hands have replaced my hands. Yep. So and they're not a guitar player. Yeah. Two things you need to do. Rehearsing like this is very different than rehearsing like this. Practice the songs st stood up. All the learning I've done for the TPS gigs, I've done stood up. Yeah. Yeah, and I've done it. We have a pedal board on, on a, in front of me on, on my dresser and start in front of it. That's one thing. The other thing is practice the volume. It, it find somewhere that you can turn your amp up to practice at the volume you're going to play on stage. Because what happens is if you're stood up, right, and you're playing, but you're at home and you're playing super, super quiet, you get to the gig and you've got drums and bass and stuff to deal with, and suddenly you're going, Whoa. the guitar is a completely different instrument. Yeah. So if you can, spend some time with an amp at volume and just have fun. Yeah. And then it's all kind of, you know, touchy-feely wellness stuff after that. It's be relaxed. Yeah. Breathe. And it's so easy to say this. I hope there'll be no breathing going on next Thursday. I was forced to do this in the earlier days of doing singing where you turn up and you're all good, you've done all your practice and everything and then you start to sing, you've got no breath. And it's because you're kind of, you're doing short breaths and you've probably been talking to people and by the time you get on stage, you realise you're out of breath. So or drunk. look at some basic breathing exercises and I know it sounds a bit touchy-feely, but just do some basic breathing exercises, learn about that because not only does that help you... Um, relax in general it will just make everything a bit easier and then of course you're going to be totally in your own head about what you're playing and you'll be completely focused on trying to play something good that you've learned how to play and it takes a while but that's the worst place you can be in your head when you're doing that stuff yeah and sometimes if you've got the discipline to do it and heaven knows i didn't for about 25 years play something simpler to get you in the game. Yeah. And just hold on to a couple of notes, just enjoy it, feel where the tone is. And I know it's all easy to say and hard to do, and I still don't do it to this day. But I think a lot of those things can just relax you into it. But the, genuinely the breathing, I, I'm a big fan of breathing, obviously. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> big fan, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it, breathing's good. Yeah. And... Um, they're with you. Everyone there is with you. Yeah. They're not they against want, you. Yeah, everyone's on your side. They all want you to do great. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it is, but it's real. The fear is real and yeah, the yeah. rubber fingers are real. I tell you what, though, once you've, if you spend some time, a little bit of prep will go a long, long way. And the feeling once you've done it after your first jam is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's life changing. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, mate. Have fun. Indeed. Enjoy. Yep. Andrew Dibble. Hello, Hello Andrew. Andrew. Uh, I'm looking for a telly bridge pickup that could get me a bit closer to Dan 64. It's a beautiful thing. Any suggestions of where to start? Um, oh, boy. What is it? What's in there at the moment? Ron Ellis. It's the Ellis. Yeah, okay. That's, and that's a Ron Ellis 5060. Yeah. Which is a slightly... Um, slight complexity in that it's got one type of magnet in the bot in the thin strings and a different type of magnet in the fat ones i believe uh, you know what's really tricky right the custom shop fender pickups are awesome so in red i've got the 63 custom shop pickup in the bridge mm -hmm. with the beveled magnets and I've I tried so many really expensive um, top end pickups in that guitar. Nothing sounded as good as that pickup in that guitar. The uh, the original 
pickup in here worked best with the original saddle pieces. But when I changed, when I put these um, saddle pieces on the titanium ones, the guitar came alive, but the pickups didn't come alive with it. Mm. All of a sudden, the bridge sounded really tinny and the neck sounded super dark. And so I had these and thought I'm going to give them a go. And because the guitar sounds so balanced, mm. these didn't work with the... Yeah, with the with different the, saddles. With, the, with different saddles, but put these saddles on and suddenly you, you the guitar goes, pick up. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was astonishing. I actually got to do a film a bit about it because it sort of blown my mind. Um, I find it hard to give pick up advice because I, I think every guitar is so unique to what it needs. How, but saying that, so, Lindy Fralins, the uh, blues. What are the what are the Fran blues? Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about Lindy Fralin pickups. Um. Anyway, there's a Lindy Fralin. I think it's uh, Tele Telecaster Blues something. The bridge, vintage blues or something, which is really. Amazing. What about the analog man one? Pristine bridge pickup. We're uh, the bridge, about. yeah, the bridge pickup. Um, I mean, yeah, those that's those sets are really great. It all depends on the guitar, though. Yeah, I've put. I can put. In any case, to popular it, it, belief, it is very much a vintage spec pickup in yeah. terms of its wind and output. And Low output. That. Yeah, be careful for the stuff that's just, you know, this stuff just pushes the mids a little bit more, pushes, the, you know, it's like vintage spec stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. They never, apparently they never use form var on telly bridge pickups. It was always plain enamel. That's another thing. Klopman, I was talking to Klopman saying, oh, God, help me out. I'm hearing mid-60s Strat pickups and I think they sound really different from early 60s ones. How much of that's to do with the wire? He's like, yeah, it's a bit to do with the wire. He said it's more to do with the potting. Yeah. What they were using to pot it, which yeah. changed all the way through magnet type. I'm like, oh God, it's a crapshoot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Frinny Blair, let's so say that Lindy Fraylin, the Blues 54s. Matt from Monty said that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, he... that he Blues 54s, he just said He so. had... Um, Matt's got this amazing... Uh, sort of board with all the different through the years all the different windings and all the different pottings that they use and you can see how drastically different they all are yeah it's amazing um good luck andrew uh loose wheel productions we have a super chat but no question actually we need to wrap up dan bloody hell it's late wow sorry i said bloody hell three now three times um uh see it's the coffee i am got the coffee back in my veins. I know. It's half seven. We I need know. meat feast. We do. We really do. Jason Thompson. Gentlemen, I want. I went to five springs in my Strat. I feel like it's changed the feel too much compared to three. It's got lots of attack and too spiky. Is it my imagination? Nope. I always say they sound more springy with less springs. Right. More traditionally stratty if that bridge is floating a bit. I think they sound stronger and... More punchy. I always use the term sledgehammer. Um, when that bridge is on the body and you've got five springs in there. So no, it's not your imagination at all. Then it starts to get really interesting when you experiment with different tensions on different numbers of strings and different types of springs. So ones that aren't quite as springy. And it all makes a difference. Indeed. It all makes a difference. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, think about it like this, right? The more tension... the so those springs, if you've got three in there, I mean, how does that work? So I'm assuming with three springs in there, this is going to be easier yep. than with five springs. Yeah. And then what happens with your three springs, your transient, as you pick, this is going to move yeah. up yeah, yeah. a bit, right? And so the transient is different than with five springs, which is why, you know, string three on a telly, the transient, that's what is, it's like, ugh. Yeah. But you know, almost like what we were talking about earlier about you know woods not necessarily contributing to the vibration of a string, more like detracting from it. And if we 
if we accept that for a second same if you've got mechanical stuff on the guitar that's moving it's going to take up some of that string vibration presumably and maybe that's what you're hearing about less you know less attacky yeah it stands the logical reason I'm, hopefully there'll be a some sort of science person in the chat will say no you've got it all wrong it's this um whatever the explanation it does make a difference yeah so Indeed. it's not it's not your you're not going crazy uh perilous temple hey mate I have no words for that show on Friday. Oh, bless you. Finally man. got to jam with a mate this week. He left his amp for four days, so I met a wet-dry rig. Made a wet-dry rig. It's life-changing. Two 18-watt amps, one EL34, one 6V6. Massive and lovely. Awesome. It's hard to go back once you've it. Really it really is. It really is. Curtis R. Oh, hello, Curtis. Hey, mate. Ends of legs. Months ago, I feared I'd trampled... Dan's lovely Neil Finn moment by asking about having him come on TPS. It was a tall order. I'm absolutely thrilled you succeeded in your ambition to speak with him again. Much love from Kansas City. Thank you, Curtis. Cheers, mate. New guitar day, says Jason Sears. Uh, it's a Duesenberg star player arriving in a few hours. Do you have any love for the star player? Star player? It's my first hollow body. Any tips on playing it? I had one. I had one for years. How hollow is it? Is it centre blocked? I think it's centre blocked. Yes, it is centre blocked. Uh, is the Star Player TV I had the double cutaway one? Um, yeah. Look, it's a. It was my main guitar while I had it for, um, and it just sounds amazing. I. I went through a period of wanting a nice old Gretsch. I couldn't afford a Gretsch. And and the Duesenbergs were there and I thought, oh, that'll do. And I made the mistake of putting some TV Joneses in the Duesenberg, looking for that Gretsch thing. And it's like, didn't work. And when the original, um, uh, the original pickups in it was so much better for that guitar. Um, so as long as the Duesenberg is the sound that you're after and like the star player TV that I had, the double cutaway white thing, flipping sounded amazing. Um, and it's on the first Tin Spirits album, really lovely guitar. Um, but then I went back to Tally's and yeah, been there ever since, but they're, they're great. Yeah, they always play fantastic. They're, they're using best, guitars. the best Bigsby style vibrator system on any guitar I've ever played. Astonishingly good. They yep. always sound really nice. So what's interesting about that is I've realised I need fight guitars. I don't need easy guitars. I can't. Me too. I, I sound play. like an idiot on an easy I can't guitar. I play easy guitars because I've grown up with fight guitars, and yep. it's really interesting. Give me a guitar I can go. Yeah, all that stuff. on. it's like, and I will do that all night. Yeah, because I. Yeah. Lovely Heavy things, though. I really like the Bonneville that we had for a minute, which is yeah. 25 and a half inch double cut. I thought yeah. that was a flipping great guitar. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Gareth Johnson wins comment of the day. Gareth, hello, mate. Hope hey, you're bad. doing all right. He says, um, TK Maxx, I once saw Yannick Gares of Iron Maiden shopping for sunglasses in Kingston TK Maxx. Get in. Wicked. I don't think it gets any better than that. Fantastic. Can you imagine Yannick Gares and TK? Are you and I met? Yes. <laughs> Do you like these? Very rock and roll. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so tips on playing your hollow body. Shouldn't be a big deal with the star player because no. it's... Um, I don't know if it's fully centre block, but it definitely has got some solidity in it. Um, it's, not all, it's also not a huge body, so you shouldn't get any of that woofy low end feedback that you get with a 335 for example yeah. or indeed a fully hollow guitar so um i used to play really loud on stage yeah and that was in the walkabout days and yeah. never had a problem with it i think um now this is going to be terribly generalistic but um semi hollows and chambered guitars in general i always feel have slightly less of that fundamental smack in the face first part of the note 
than the fully hollow guitars do. Than a solid body. Oh, okay, right. And there's just there just is a bit more, for want of a better word, colour. Sure. And a bit more harmonic interest in a, in a semi-hollow or a chambered guitar. And I think you can enjoy that. You can enjoy it by, by using the sustain. You can enjoy it by inducing some feedback because it will feed back a little bit easier than a fully solid guitar. Yeah. And it's a it's a different thing. Yeah. I think certainly for twangy sounds, there's almost nothing better. Yeah. For sure. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yep. Have fun, mate. Elliot Green. My mate Paul was in a band called Elliot Green. Good evening, guys. I've never played with other people due to anxiety as a 27 year old. I don't know any friends who play old blues music. How would you recommend getting experience and confidence to play with people live? Good question, Elliot, because I think there's a hell of a lot of people in this in this yeah. situation. Yeah. I would suggest if you have got a jam night near you, just go along without the intention to play to start with go along and have a listen and most of the jam nights that I've been to actually I can say without fail every single jam night that I've been to everyone there is on your side everyone there no one's everyone's there sort of willing you on um but if you go there to start with without just to have a listen to what they're doing and then if you feel more comfortable with it then maybe you feel more comfortable getting up stage and having a go um yeah i mean it's leaping straight into a a jam night is quite it's pretty pressured depending on the jam night to, yeah yeah some are a bit more organized and kind of a little more standoffish than others Maybe a first step would be to find somebody else, a work colleague, I don't know, friend of a friend, someone you know will play the guitar. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody somewhere will play the guitar and they may well be in the same situation that you're in. And you can... I, funnily, I was thinking about this the other day. So when I was in my teens, early teens, actually before that, probably nine and ten years old, my mate Steve played the guitar. Oh wow! And my brother played the guitar. So right from that age, yeah, you got this. So, we were doing stuff. Yeah, it's around you. And you lose quite a bit of that inhibition just by doing a bit of that. So it's never too late. Um, just I don't know, someone at work, friend of a friend, if they play the guitar, just have a jam with them. It's two things happen. One is you start to lose the inhibition. Yeah. Two, you'll teach each other. And it doesn't matter if they're much better than you or you're much better than them, or should I say more advanced or less advanced, you will teach each other things. And it's a really, really great experience. So maybe try that. And then if you really can't find anyone, yeah, think about a jam type environment. But there's usually somebody in your vicinity or your circle who will play guitar. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. That's, and when you find those people, it's such a valuable thing. One of the things that Mick and I... Um, talk about a lot and we're going to try and work out a way to do this it's just understanding the value of those relationships in not just in your playing life but just in life in general yeah. um, you know the, both of us over the years that we've had people in our lives have been so influential in that yeah and just being able to talk about playing guitar and about you know I'm so blessed that i get to spend as much time with mick as i do likewise and it's been it's been the best thing for my playing ever actually same you know exactly the same yeah sat here week in week out plus a bit of red light fever plus you know if we play badly you sure gonna hear about it in the comments so there is a bit of there is a little bit of having to you know pushing yourself a bit yeah. bit harder than maybe you you're happy with being pushed so um, that could be an argument for doing the jam night, actually. But yeah. what you what you don't want is for it to be a negative experience. I remember the first recording I ever did for Guitarist magazine. The producer who was doing it, I think, was trying to do the producer's job and cajole me into doing it better. But actually, it was it went completely the opposite way. I oh, was really right. nervous, and 
he would compose the tracks and you'd just sort of play what he told you to play, basically, at that time, for ease of expediency. And I think his comment was, what, you can't even play a C7 chord and you're working on Guitarist magazine? Yeah, no thanks. And I think he made, meant it as a joke, but I took it to heart and I just, it took me ages to get over that right. which is ridiculous you know you've got to have you've got to have a bit more of a backbone than that but you don't want it to be a negative experience you want a positive outcome and that's why smaller steps might be a good way to get going because yeah. you don't but you know other people are different other people have just got the determination mm. and a comment like that wouldn't throw them off yeah indeed but i've always been a bit sensitive um yeah best of luck mate yeah, good luck, Elliot. And uh, I, I get the anxiety thing. It's, it's a big deal when you're sort of bearing yourself like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike2203. Hello, Mike2203. Hey, he says, hi, guys. I've never had the chance to play a two rock amp. Are they handmade? Just curious, as I didn't realise how expensive they are. <laughs> yeah, they're not cheap. Um, yeah, they are handmade. They're totally handmade. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're completely hand-wired. And... They're amazing. Yeah. They're amazing. Um yeah, I mean, I do know people that make very tidy circuit board amps that look inside amps like Two Rocks and Matchless and go, really? Yeah. Because... They can't see the value in it. They can't see the point of it, yeah. and they also think it's a mess. So uh, stand on that where you will. Um, that's the best guitar amp I've ever heard with my own ears. Yeah. It's amazing. For me personally. Yeah. It doesn't work for everyone. We have had people in who play it and they're like, just don't get it. So horses for courses. Indeed. Um, the, the wider point there, Mike, is yes, they're handmade. And of course, where they're made and how they're made are the biggest um, influences of price. Because obviously, if they're handmade in very small numbers in a place in the United States where people get paid lots of money, and live very comfortable lives once you stick that through the the mill and you end up with a retail price yeah they're really expensive yeah um certainly if you built it on a production line somewhere in the world where people don't get paid so much yeah and maybe don't have the same sort of you know i don't know holiday pay sickness pay social security benefits all those things that we expect in our lives but somehow we would are very happy for someone else not to have it so that we can buy cheap gear don't get me started on that um so yeah, handmade stuff by tiny companies who don't sell very many stuff. Uh, things is expensive. Add up the component cost, doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's how that works. Same with guitars. Um, I have a custom high watt twenty, an orange OR fifteen, and a Tweedy Blues Junior. Says Matthew Duroch. Lovely. I'm thinking the blues junior since the high watt has great cleans if mm. i sell it will i be missing something i love that high watt app they're brilliant yeah i don't think so I don't yeah think i don't think so i don't see if <laughs> do you love the sound of the blues junior yeah and if you love it and the others don't do it don't sell it yeah if you're kind of like me sell it indeed there look if you sell it and you miss it, you can grab another one. There are loads. I was going to say there. they're not exactly rare. Yeah, exactly. Um, although the tweed ones maybe tiny bit more rare, but mm. nice. Yeah, I, you know the answer, Matthew. Excuse me. My stomach is saying, "Where's my meat?" Uh, uh, mine is also. You can laugh at that in America. Um, Yellow House Blues Band, Matt. Yellow House Blues Band, Matt. Hello, uh, Dan Drive Tweedy, or Mad Professor Big. Tweedy drive. I use a two rock studio signature. Cool. Yeah, you do. And a 335. Or should I buy a Blues Junior instead? Um, that's how much a Dan Drive pedal is these days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that Dan Drive pedal is astonishing. Yeah, I've got the high power twin version of it. So it's not the deluxe version, it's the twin version of it. And it sounds astoundingly good. Yeah, it's magic. My only issue which might be relevant to you and your 335 and the two rock it's got a lot of bottom end right so depending on the style of music you play depending on how you kind of like your guitar sounds it's got a tremendous amount of bottom end which could be cool mm. maybe less cool depending on what you like it's also 
to get the drive happening in a place where I really love it, it's also blimmin' loud. Yeah. So, a bit like the Tula in many respects. Mm. You know, Josh Smith, not it doesn't sound like the Tula. My point is, Josh Smith plays the Tula, makes it sound awesome. Lots of people get one and go, hmm, I don't get it. This is hard work. Yeah. Then you hear Josh play, it's like, oh, okay. And I think it's the same with the Tweedy. You know, it's, it's not like a super friendly overdrive pedal it's you've got to play it you yeah. have to play it and yeah. commit to it now i haven't played the um mad professor big tweedy drive but everything harry does is awesome i haven't plugged into a single pedal this made and not gone wow never played a mad professor pedal i don't like yeah he yeah. makes he's he's got a he knows what he's doing b he's got people around him who've got amazing ears c he's got amazing ears and i know these are all um, value judgments, but in terms of the kind of sounds that me and him like. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, but yeah. I haven't actually heard that one in my own ears. Should you buy a Blues Junior instead of the um, Dan Drive? You've got a studio signature. What do you want a Blues Junior for would be my question. Yeah. You've got one of the best amps available of all time ever. Yeah. Um, and that's not to be pejorative about the Blues Junior. Great, loads of people got them super thing but the two rocks are different thing yeah. um unless you don't love it and there are people who don't love it and yeah. you might love the blues junior more so i think that's the other the, the other tweed pedal i would recommend which completely passed us by despite it being up on the shelf there for years is the zvex 59 sound and i took that to my gig two sundays ago and had it on all gig yeah. i flipping love it yeah magic so um it's so hard isn't it it's so hard. So many great things out there. Yeah. So many great things out there. Anyway, the other thing with Dan is if you go on the uh, wait list now, you're going to have to wait a bit. And then if you don't like it, you could always sell it because his pedals are so rare now. Eager Ray Rob's come. I was just notified that my Dan Drive Twitty will be here in the next few weeks. Yes. Awesome. Enjoy, Rob. Yeah. It's a, it's a, oh man, they just, he does good stuff. Right, we've gone well over. We have. With We're apologies. Knocking on three hours. To, to BV, who is probably really needs his dinner right now, as do we. Thanks for being here. Dan yeah, and I have got everyone. a stupidly exciting couple of weeks coming up. Yep. Um, we shall do our best to keep you updated of that progress. Indeed. Um, we'll try and post a few things to Patreon, some little BTS clips of... Uh, when a certain Mr. Timmons gets here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for your suggestions about shows. We will go through the comments and have a read. Yeah. Um, and we'll see what we can come Some up with. Some good ideas there. Yeah, yeah, thanks everyone. See you soon. Feast. Feast. That ain't no Hank Williams song.